There's a trend on TikTok right now, at the time of this recording anyway, to make videos in the style of a Wes Anderson movie, using symmetry, wide shots, neutral expressions, bright colors, and elaborate theatrical scenic design. I'm a longtime fan of Wes Anderson, a fellow Dallas guy whose debut feature, Bottle Rocket, was the talk of my hometown back in the 90s. Looking back at that movie now, it's probably his least Wes Anderson movie, but still... I remember seeing it at a film festival, and at the time, it just blew my mind. The subtle quirkiness of the actors and the way the camera framed every shot. You knew he was a special director from square one. So I'm thrilled that younger people are still into Anderson's obsession with diorama theatricality, his sense of the whimsical and absurd, as well as his exploration of pop psychology of human feelings. To me, Wes Anderson is one of the few directors where I think, Wow, this is why I go to the movies, to see someone tell a story made for film. No matter how serious he gets, everything is bolstered by dollhouse playfulness. I say all that to let you know I adore Wes Anderson, and you need to know that and you need to know that for what I'm about to say. It occurred to me this week while watching the brand new film Bo is Afraid that Ari Aster is Wes Anderson for serious people. Ari Aster is evil Wes Anderson. Symmetry, wide shots, neutral expressions, bright colors, and elaborate theatrical design in each of his three films, plus a pop psychological exploration of human feelings. But Ari Aster is super dark, real dark. Horror and comedy are two sides of the same coin, we say it all the time, and Aster's quirky choices and visuals are terrifyingly existential even when they're comedic. To Wes Anderson's credit, it's hard not to love him. He's accessible to most everyone, parents, kids, suburbanites, artists, normies, etc. Whereas Ari Aster wants you to see the blood. He wants you to understand the fine line between life and death. Both filmmakers place flawed and unlikable characters at the centers of their movies, but Wes wants you to laugh at their foibles. Ari, on the other hand, wants you to see yourself in there too. Bo is Afraid is three hours of meandering visuals, absurd gimmicks, cheap humor, and cheap scares, and a central character who has no agency whatsoever. It was a miserable experience, and I kind of loved it. Ari Aster is Wes Anderson for Sickos. Hi, Cecil. Hi, Jeffrey. What's your favorite Wes Anderson movie? What's my favorite Wes Anderson movie? Okay, let's run through the list here. I mean, The World Ten and Bombs, I think, was the one that like solidified the Wes Anderson vibe like it baked it all in so mm -hmm. i'm gonna go with that one yeah i think that too i i think i'm gonna put that i i, I liked moonlight kingdom like rushmore is fun rushmore is yeah. fun but rushmore i would rather was... just watch um uh what was the you know um election with reese witherspoon if i would you know <laughs> yeah if, if you're really gonna watch that kind of mood shitty high schoolers and adults interact yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I uh, I really liked Moonlight Kingdom. I thought it was like that nice balance of like. Did I see Moonlight Kingdom? I don't think I saw that one. Weed and sort of serious and like. Super oh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox. I like that one. Oh, a lot. that's great. I loved Fantastic Mr. Fox. That was one where like the music and like the animation and the celebrity, like the crazy celebrity voices, just all blended. Because I yeah. wasn't actually looking at Meryl Streep and George Clooney, so I could like I was just watching foxes that had incredibly cheeky, quirky voices. Yeah, yeah. There's uh it's funny because like twee, all that mid mid aughts tweeness that was so popular, mm -hmm. like everyone had a ukulele. Uh, oh my and, god, yeah. And, 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 a, and, a, and a weird fedora. Yes. And it's funny because a lot of that twee stuff hasn't survived, right? We we kind of moved past that culturally, but there are elements of stuff like not, nothing dies for real, like in, yeah. in, in popular culture. And it's funny that like Wes Anderson's like kind of like tweeness is kind of what has lingered for so long. It still captures the imagination. Uh, and I love it. I'm here for it. I like it a lot. And it was uh, watching this particular movie. I think it's during the third act with Theater in the Woods in Bo is Afraid that I realized like, oh, this is, I was hearkening back to uh, Hereditary. And mm -hmm. Hereditary is all about dioramas. It's all yeah, about yeah. the verisimilitude, the, the the recursive function of like life within art, within life, within sure. art. And all of those layers and the theatricality of it too, the the the, the careful staging and like still camera. And um, yeah, I just, I thought, wow, this is, this is evil Wes Anderson. And uh I'm fine with it. I uh, I loved that he went for humor in this movie. This is definitely, oh yeah, dark comedy. It feels more Charlie Kaufman than 
It feels more like Synecdoche, New York than it does hereditary. That's, I kept thinking that so much, so, so much. And it was actually during that third act that I was like, are we just watching Synecdoche, New York again? Uh -huh. <laughs> but yep. with like just different famous, like best of the best actors, but also a little bit skin of our teeth. You know, that play Skin of Our Teeth, it had oh, that sort of heightened yeah. reality of like, this is a family. They represent all American families, the all American family. Yes. It's a return to the absurd, right? You, you can see you can see the imprint of people like Edward Albee on this, too. I don't know if I'd say absurd. I would say I'd say magical realism for sure. OK, yeah. But I but does it go full absurd? Yeah, you're probably right. It's a little bit too linear, maybe a little bit too direct. Um, like just because your dad is a giant dick that your mom keeps in the the attic doesn't mean it's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> that just means that you grew up in uh, my neighborhood. Yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, to to start this off, to say that you know this is if you are not necessarily a fan of horror or a fan of Ari Aster's previous movies, this movie, this Bo, Bo is afraid has a lot of similarities to those two earlier movies, but. He's he's letting you know that it is a comedy from the get go, like a dark comedy. But yeah. it, again, it's it's going to feel more Charlie Kaufman than than horror. Oh, um, for sure. Per se. Yeah, there were definitely horrific elements to it. Very. But that much was so. not the uh, and 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 actually, you had to look very closely to find a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, like they were almost like there's this movie just has so much in it because it is three hours of like a lot of filmmaking. But like a lot of the horrific elements were so fast, Jeffrey, like yeah. the, the scary bits were like flash and then they were gone. You're like, did I just see a picture of a mother with a claw talon digging into her baby's head? <laughs> I guess I did. Oh, they're talking again. OK, I guess I should listen. This is also a movie I was reading a little bit about this film, too, and the the the, the scenic design and like uh, the prop work in this movie that yes. there's a lot of really funny, tiny jokes throughout. And so many people who have watched it twice or more have gone back and noticed all the little jokes in it. So, I mean, one of the ones that I noticed in watching it was there's a sign in his apartment in this first act. This is a four act film in the first very clear four act film. <laughs> Some oh, yeah, films yeah. you're like, uh, I don't Bo know where the Bo is afraid of the city. Bo mm -hmm. is afraid of the suburbs. Bo is afraid of a play. And Bo is afraid of his mother. Those are the four acts. <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, but in that first act, when he's at his uh, scary ass apartment, there's right. a um, there's a sign up all over the apartment building that says "Warning: Brown Recluse Spider that, right? on the I Loose." Yeah. And there's a picture yes. of a brown. What is not even a brown recluse spider? <laughs> oh, no. Growing up in Texas, oh, no. I know what a brown recluse looks like. Um, but it is a uh, warning brown recluse spider on the loose. And then at the bottom, it just has a quote. And it says, the price of greatness is responsibility, Winston Churchill. And I I, I laughed out loud in the theater when wow. I saw that sign. Uh, okay, so mine was, mine was um, uh, when he gets to his mom's house and he's looking through the accolades of mom throughout mm -hmm. the Mona, big, big Mona, what big Mona has been doing for the last mm -hmm. 50 years. And one of the drugs that she invented was just called do it all. <laughs> As in like, I take this drug and it'll just do it all. Just do it all. Just do it. I just want to take a drug. It'll do it all. It's so good. I cackled and everybody turned and looked at me because I saw this in a theater, Jeffrey, mm -hmm. in a uh, movie theater. I know. It's amazing to see a movie like this in the theater. I was definitely sitting around people. I had a similar experience watching this in the theater that I did with Skinamarink, which is... Oh, sure. Uh, my friend did that I was with... just get fucked off? They're like, enough of this. There was a little bit of of like, ugh, you know, people like, oh my God. And yeah, I got to be, some of that too. To be fair to them and also the people who saw who I saw Skinema Rink with like there's a lot in both movies that I understand why this is a complete turnoff to people like there's yeah. a lot wrong or I don't want to go say wrong there's a lot in this movie that I found really really frustrating and the center That's of right. which is the character of Bo oh who Bo. has no he has he no agency he is human tofu it's aggravating to watch that for three hours. Like yeah, I'm it's, and I know that's kind of the point of the movie. Yeah. 
but it's hard. It's a hard to watch. But that's the thing. I, I think, and I think a lot of people, so, you know, I, I was like talking to a couple friends. I'm like, hey, I got to go see this movie. It's only playing at one theater and it's the big theater and, and it's three hours. And all my friends are like, hell no. Uh -huh. um, so I went by myself. But I, I think the thing about this movie is that it asks a lot of the viewer, mm -hmm. similar to Skinamarink. Like, it's not, you don't enjoy this movie. This is not a movie to be enjoyed. <laughs> in the same way that, like, Catcher in the Rye is not a book that you casually pick up and just think, like, oh, this will be a lark. You know, yeah. just like a like a fun beach read. So if you're ready for that, I found it very rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, like, the characters are all terrible. The world is all terrible. But it's so beautiful in how terrible it is. And I gotta say, Ari Aster, the way, like his use of, of color theory, color and light and camera movement, um, and not to mention like his casting and like just like the what the actors were doing on the screen mm -hmm. was phenomenal. But you gotta like put on your like you know like I don't know put on a crash helmet and like knee pads and protector elbow pads of cinema. And be like, I'm going to watch the fuck out of this movie or else you won't make it up that hill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I came away from this movie thinking oh, what I do a lot of, about a lot of movies that are longer than two hours, which is I would like sure. this to be under two hours. I know. I and also I, thought I was like, you could have cut 40. Listen, d does Bo really need to be afraid of a play? Does does he really do we really need to be doing zip zaps up in the uh, did you catch that? Did you see them? Doing oh, I, I missed them playing Zip Zaps Off. That's they were great. legit playing Zip Zaps Off, which if you were a theater kid, then everybody knows the game Zip Zaps Off. And I mm -hmm. kind of wanted to be like, tag yourself. I'm playing Zip Zaps Off. And then you already <laughs> tag yourself. Off. I'm Zop. Nice. Uh, yes, you're Zop. So, yeah, I, I think that for me, I loved that third act. I loved the theater. I scene. loved it. That was that was where I thought this this movie is now. I love this movie regardless of what happens after this. Sure. Uh, also, all of the animation, the stop motion animation that's it's done so in, is well, it's done. It, it was um, was it like rotoscope style where they painted over the the film? Well, it was it was done by the folks who did um, Cristobal Leone and Joaquin Cochina, who did um, Wolf House. Okay, gotcha. So, uh, and I, I immediately thought that when it was happening, oh, I'm like, wow, this feels. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting Wolf House. I'm getting yeah, yeah. Wolf House notes. On oh this. wow! Oh wow! Uh, That's yeah. funny. I'm getting. I'm getting. Um, mommy's dick husband in an attic <laughs> on the nose. <laughs> on the. Nose. But then it. But then it's real smooth after that. Um, Can I we begin at the beginning. Let's begin though? at the beginning. Well, I was in my to transition to the beginning uh, off of what we were just talking about, like where to cut from this movie, this first act. There is so much. I love it. Uh, it's I love great, it. but there is. This is where this forty-five minute first act yeah. could be twenty minutes because mm. half of it is just him on the phone having zero com, like just reacting to a conversation, or, or not even reacting, just sitting there quietly, going, just reacting um, to anything, or just like, um, okay, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, what to do. Uh, silence. Oh. I'll take that silence as a yes. There's like more silences are being taken as yes in this film that I was like, okay, come on. You got to do something. Okay. So like we begin with birth. Bo is born. I love this as an opening scene sets the tone for everything. The whole thing. Because in it is. Very, it, yeah. Oh my God. Jeffrey, like it is. Um, some people walked in during this and they like, like it is pure soundscape mm -hmm. um, in the movie theater um, and at home. If you're watching this at home. But it's like the sound of, of you don't know what. And then mm -hmm. weird flashing lights of you don't know what. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you realize, oh, that's you're a baby and you're going to be born. And uh, you're, you are. Mm -hmm. And your mother is screaming, why isn't he breathing? Why isn't he breathing? Why isn't he breathing the entire time? And Why then, isn't he crying? Oh, why isn't he crying? Oh, my God. Even more specific. Yes. Yeah. Why because... isn't he crying? And the thing is, this is a character throughout this movie who is not going to speak up for himself. He yep. is not going to openly express pain. He's yeah. afraid of putting his pain on anyone. He is, uh, to, to put it bluntly, this movie is about dissociation. Like this yeah, movie yeah, is yeah. about a person who has disappeared so far into themselves that they are outside of themselves. Yeah. And um, yeah. The, oh, why oh, is the doctor crying? slaps him on the butt? 
and he cries, and we get a title card. Yes. So this is Bo Wasserman, and he is living in, as an adult, this is Joaquin Phoenix, as an adult, he is living in the dystopian city of Corinna Corinna, which is <laughs> very much like the 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 conservative idealized version of crime ridden New York. Everyone in the city yeah. is homeless, yeah. part of a gang, a serial yeah. killer, and addicted to drugs. Yeah. Everyone. Everyone. Except Bo. And yeah. <laughs> Literally just running. Actually, okay, here's the here was the read that you know, I like uh, there's a lot of reads on this movie, but this movie is about conservative America in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Like at one point I was like, is Am I just am I the only one getting the political vibes of like this is what any adult over the age of 40 that ha watches more than 2 hours of Fox News a day this is how they think the world is. Yeah. Throughout all four acts I would say this is like it's very much that which I thought was actually kind of like a bold political statement in a lot of places. Yeah. Because it allows Ari Oster to like completely you know, pick apart teenage behavior, phone behavior, um, v v Vietnam, or, you know, uh, Desert Storm Vets, um, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. But it's a very American movie. And for that reason, this sort of like, I'm terrified of everyone. I was just trying to help, but I can't help it. Because What should I do to help? Yeah. What should I do? Just tell me what to do and I'll make it better. Just please don't look at me anymore. Yeah. It did seem like kind of a read on... I don't know, sort of centrist, middle middle American, you know, Democrat, Republican. Et cetera, yeah, et it it definitely did, and 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 the the fears that Bo has as a, you assume like a mid forties, late forties man, a white cis man, yeah, in his forties, uh, it, the the his fears are kind of the culmination of a lot of like white cis male fears which is i fear crime in the city yes, uh, yes. i i fear my mother <laughs> i, I fear, fear mother. teenagers and not just teenagers but teenage girls, girls who yeah. will claim that i have assaulted who are them they're who are so mean mean they're mean but they also the they, they threaten to oh my God, right? they threaten to claim to incriminate, that he is, to incriminate yeah. him and so these are all these kind of like, as you said, Cecil, like these conservative terrors yeah. of of people who are so sheltered, of individualistic people who don't get out in the world and they think that uh, Chicago is a war zone, you yeah, know, exactly. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bo has a therapist, or does he? Is does that he? a therapist? <laughs> Listen, we, I, I, I liked, and it's uh, the cast is phenomenal. The cast. Okay, here's the thing: Ooh. we got to talk about the casting. Because mm. it is, as you texted me last night, uh, Patty Lapone and Parker Posey in the same movie, squee my heart. Uh huh. But this this casting is so New York Broadway royalty. Yeah, like it is. It is like be like the best of the best of what New York. Like it's not an L.A. casting director, whoever this was, but it is. But it's not because okay. So Stephen uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson of Fences mm -hmm. fame. Um, is his therapist and he is just you know in this first scene that mom is the issue on the table that we are not discussing uh -huh. you already understand like we're in minute one of this film and mom is you know like it's rough being Bo sometimes because he's uh talking to his therapist about going home to see mom Mm -hmm. And uh and what you is know, the, the therapist said? Like, like I just wonder if you'd go to the if a, if a well is trying to poison you, would you go to that well again? And he's yes. like, he's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, yeah, I think I would. Yeah. And the therapist is like, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, you know, Bo is obviously very worried about his upcoming trip home, flight home yes. to see his mother, yeah. and um. The therapist at the end of it basically is like, here, I've got a perfect script for you. I will oh write God, you up I this know. script. Uh, the only thing is, do not, you have to drink that you have Must to take, take it with this water. with water. If you do not take it with water, bad things will happen. <laughs> yeah, and if you stop breathing, call me. He was like, I was like, oh, okay. And then what does he say? Break a leg. 
Break good luck. a leg. Yeah. I think he says break a leg, but he I says essentially so. like good luck. <laughs> yes. So, okay, let's talk about this neighborhood, this block. Oh my that god, Bo I fucking love this. This okay. is like it's like it's like a musical set of of West Side Story gone terrible on oxycotton and meth. Like it's gone terribly terribly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. He uh we see these like horrible people in the street and one of which is this like super skinny man full of tattoos and body yeah. piercings he's got the eye the, mods that he's got oh, the fully yeah, yeah, black yeah. eyes yeah and you see him look down the street and he sees Bo running at like toward him uh -huh. and then yeah. he goes running at Bo, and Bo is trying to beat him to the front door of his apartment building and get in this is like it sets up immediately that we're not really sure if this is real or not. Yeah, it is can't any be of this real. This is the part where you realize, okay, we're we're entering a realm of unreality here. Yeah. Well, even be you know that so that directly relates to Bo. But then there's the um the the man who jumps off the the building. Ever he's like, what are y'all doing up there? And there, and some guy's like, oh, there's somebody. We're trying to get somebody to jump off a building. And everybody is of course filming it. The person does jump off the building, and then that person just sits dead and frozen in the street yes for the rest of the act yes You're like uh, oh he has to like jump over it every time he can't he can't like just go to the other side of the street he has to jump over the dead body yes every time and the dead body stays in the street it is never cleaned yep. up the whole yep. time we are in act one that body is always there he gets into his apartment. We've got, like we mentioned earlier, there is uh, Chekhov's brown recluse spider on the loose yes. in the apartment. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about this, too, is all of the graffiti up. And not that graffiti and scratchiti don't exist in New York City or in big city areas. But it is not to this level at all, having been freshly living in New York City. It's just, it cracks me up, this level of dick drawings on the wall and all kinds dick of shit. Draw, but like, kill children. Yes. Shit. Die. Yeah. Which honestly, if I was, like, I started watching this from the point of view of like a 55 year old cis straight man from Iowa. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, gosh, this does kind of, this looks scared. This, uh, this makes me nervous and afraid. I, I don't want to go to now. New York now. I don't want to go there. Go to, honey, let's go to Lake Tahoe instead. Yeah, that's, or Tampa. Ta let's go to Tampa. Uh, Fort Lauderdale's nice. Well, the, the oh, I also wanted to point out the name of the adult store on the corner of his oh, building. No. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah, called yeah. Erection Ejection. Oh my god, which is really funny. Yes. But that comes into that's that actually comes into play thematically. That does makes that? sense. Well, when oh, we yeah, think well, about the story oh, he was god. told by his mother. Oh Jesus. Okay, so he's in his apartment, and late at night, he there. This is where this we is get so into scary. horror elements, tons yes. of horror elements in this movie. Yeah, yeah. And it's oftentimes things that are kind of far away. And this is where he's asleep in his bed. It's like two in the morning and he wakes up to somebody walking in the hallway. And we see this is always a scary horror trope shadow yeah. of feet beneath a door. Right. And the person slides a note and walks away. He goes and looks at the note. And it's dead quiet and dark. He is sleeping in his apartment. You don't hear anything in this building. And he picks up the note and reads it. And it says, for the love of God, turn down your music. It's 2 a.m. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, okay, weird. And he gets more of these and more of these. And, then and they're more and like, more aggressive. My favorite is, I ask you to turn it down and you turn it up? What the fuck? And I was like, <laughs> if there isn't a more perfect metaphor for Twitter, then I don't think I know <laughs> what it is. It is. It is. This is Twitter happening in real life. In real life, like with your neighbor. Um, yeah. But it's so tense because they keep coming and like and it's like every four like he and what's weird is that he wakes up to see the note mm -hmm. like he's like it, if this were a normal movie and a normal person not you know whatever this is uh he would just sleep through it but yeah. it's like he has to like if there is an ex if there is an experience that could bring anxiety bo has got to be there yeah it's like bo almost seeks out these anxieties in his life as if yeah, they come he, at, they do come at him pretty hard yes as in like the fourth note literally the person slides down into the door in a smooth but you know very kind of showy directorship kind of way the note slides through the through the apartment right up to his bed 
Mm -hmm. and stops. And it's like, you know, fuck you. How about this? And then the neighbor turns on his music so loud that it shakes his wall. Yeah. So he's not getting any sleep. He oversleeps yep. his alarm the next morning when he's supposed to fly home to see his mother. He is, which I love that he was supposed to be on a, like a five o'clock flight. And I was like, "How much did you sleep? How far? How long did you sleep?" <laughs> and he is trying to get his suitcase packed and get everything together. And he, uh, you know, gets his suitcase, makes his way to yep. the door, has his key in the door, is locking it, and then realizes I forgot something. He opens his, his door. Well. The floss scene is so weird because so he leaves the key in the door, the suitcase yep. in the hallway. He runs back to his bathroom. He opens the medicine cabinet. There's floss there. He reaches in, hesitates, yeah, and picks it up. Yeah. Sets it back down, reaches for something else, hesitates, picks the floss back up again. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in this time, somebody has stolen his keys out of his door and his yep. suitcase. Yes. Just gone. And there's his sort of super you know, uh, is is down the hall. And he's like, um, uh, excuse me, did you see anybody? And the guy was like, you're fucked. Which I was like, <laughs> okay, well, now we know exactly where we are. We are in a film in which everything Bo experiences is a construct. Yes. Like, these are not real people playing real characters. This is not Tony Kushner's, you know, Lincoln. This yeah. is... This is going to be everybody is playing kind of that like skin of our teeth, like heightened reality, magic reality thing. Yeah. You know, he calls his mother because oh, he's sort of and and uh, she handles this great. She's she real she supportive. Really does. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. Because this is the first time that we know that this is all we know. OK, we're like, OK, this is going to be all about mother. And at first he he's like he's almost catatonic already mm -hmm. it's only like eight, 10 minutes into the film and i'm like jesus christ can you imagine this guy going through airport security here we go <laughs> oh my god uh these all of these phone calls in this first man i said it before i'm keep harping on it but yeah they're, they're frustrating to watch because he never speaks up and there is a real sitcom like classic yeah. threes company yeah. uh green acres mm -hmm. type of effect to this which is problems compound because yeah. you need to constantly have a misunderstanding yeah, or yeah, a mistake yeah, yeah. that leads to another series of mistakes. Uh, it is kind it, of Dick Van Dyke mm -hmm. on like on Ritalin, isn't it? It you is. Know? Yeah, it totally is. So she is obviously not uh, here for this and she just dismisses him and is like, you know, basically kind of fuck you. Fuck you for, well, he for ruining me, it. But he asks her, he asks her, like i was like okay i don't have my keys my apartment is open i could come and she and there's like the longest pause in the world she's like i'll talk to you soon and just mm -hmm. hangs up no you're right and i'm glad you mentioned that because i i almost forgot this is such an important moment that very exchange because he also said what do you think i should do what do you think I like what should i do like in something that is any normal person Mm -hmm. in talking to their mother to their parent to a loved one mm -hmm. would say i need help i need advice something really fucked up has happened to me yeah what do i do yeah i want to come but also i you know something fucked up has happened what should i do and she and is his, tired she, of that shit she just yeah, is she like is. yeah no uh, uh, if you can't make up your mind i'm not here to help you what does she say i think you'll do the right thing yeah. So he, um, I don't know if this is the same day or later the next day, but he takes the new medication. Yeah. And then realizes there's a water outage in his building. Yes. And he cannot puke the medicine back yeah, up yeah, yeah. and he, he gets into get a panic. Up. And this is one of the few moments where he shows some agency, which is interesting because yeah. it is for the medication. It is not for anything else. Well, it is. Because an authority figure has told him must take with You're right. water. And we know that Bo, Bo is just tofu. And if, and if, you know, cayenne pepper says, take it with water, then you've got to take it with water. Because yeah. cayenne pepper will always win over the taste of tofu. Right. Yeah. He has to like get his get across the street but he doesn't have keys so he props the door open which i think is very funny with a 2022 phone book yeah, i know right? <laughs> I'm like is that a real thing yeah. and um 
he gets across the street to the bodega. No, no okay. wait, this street, this Please. street is <laughs> because it's like, like as he's sitting there choking, like dry gagging on meds, which is something like I like Ari Aster hits so many like things that are like, oh my god, that's me. You know, uh -huh. like as someone who takes medication every day, I'm like, oh, I gotta take these stupid pills. Mm -hmm. Like finding anything is a source of anxiety. But this street is beyond. He's like, okay, there's uh he looks across the street and there's a bodega, and there's literally a guy setting a giant pallet of water down. And then it and then it sort of like scans the street leading up to his door. And there's literally like, well, there's the cha-cha guy, there's the guy who's always kind of like gay, naked, semi-naked cha-cha guy. There's um there's two people fighting, screaming at each other. Is have we gotten to the naked stabby guy yet? Oh yeah, I think earlier that day he was watching the news and there was this like news report about a serial killer on the loose called like na naked stab man. Naked birthday boy stab stab birthday boy birthday stabbing guy birthday soup stab man stab stab man yeah stab just man. A naked another naked middle aged guy who likes who's, who's just repeatedly will stab anything yes but it's this anxiety of like having to go outside is it is is a little difficult mm -hmm. because all he has like it's oh my god it's so funny I love it when he actually does go outside and there's somebody just going help. Help me, 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 help me. And that too, he manages to avoid. Like, oh my God, it's so good. But also kind of how I imagine, you know, conservatives see America as just everyone walking around saying, help me, help me, help me. It really is. And being like, I can't, here's here's five cents. Please go away. Yeah. Please don't bother me with your problems. So he gets over there, gets his bottle of water, not without a lot of consternation from the shopkeeper yep. because he doesn't have enough money. And the shopkeeper is like, I will call the police, which yeah. is funny because there's so much, like what are the police yeah. going to do over a oh dollar God, 79? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it, it, it is spiking his fear that somebody would call the cops that he oh didn't have enough money to pay for his dollar 79 bottle of water. Because his credit card is suddenly declined. Right. Oh, another God. huge, yeah, a terrifying fear, right? That you would be yeah. without money, without keys, without anything. And as he tries to but get- now spo But spoiler, mm. spoiler, this is all part of Mona's plan. This is where like Mona's plan, spoiler, Mona ain't dead. Um, right. Mom, well, we mommy, haven't even gotten to her being dead yet. So no, yeah. Mommy can't die. Yeah. Mommy can never die. So he gets- uh, he tries to get back to his apartment, and what happens is the homeless people, drug addicts, population has figured out that the place is open. Like, they all enter the building and go straight to his straight apartment. His, like like water down a drain. Like, yeah. Like a trickle at first, and he's kind of like watching it as it goes. Oh, my God. It's so, it is so anxiety-inducing. Yep. And they're having a rager, and he sleeps yeah. outside on some scaffolding, wakes up to a construction worker just working around him. Yeah. And he gets back into his apartment. There's the tattooed man from earlier is just dead on the floor with like a chunk torn out of his neck. Yeah. With like nine and one dialed on his phone. <laughs> yes. And oh, <laughs> so horror. I also comedy. love that like in the microwave just has a sign that says do not open. Yes. And somebody like, just the left the blender the running. The, I blender the blender is running, just like running. Just yeah. brown liquid in there that could be anything. Like the, it is, it is. Oh, the smudges also, like, on the dicks walls and butts. You yeah. know, like there's someone like this, a common a common theme is like it's someone ejaculate like the graffiti of someone ejaculating into their own mouth. That sort of like yes. weird circular, yeah, homophobic kind of thing of like, oh no. If dicks and butts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a merry Christmas. That's right. So he also there's the shoe. That is jammed oh into, into his computer laptop. monitor. Yeah. 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 So he is trying to find another flight to get home, yeah. but like his credit card has declined. And he call he calls his mother, but a man answers the phone, voiced by Bill Hader, by the way. I, I noticed that too. Um yeah. and it is a UPS driver who's just trying to deliver a package to his mom's house, and he found Bo's mom dead but under did a shed. Well, but but that's the thing. Nobody says anything definitively ever in this movie. It's no. always 
what does your mother look like? Mm -hmm. How old is she? Like nobody. I like, like wait. I like what the what does your yeah. What, what does your mother look did like? You dial. I liked what does your mother look like? And he's yeah. like, well, she has uh, brown eyes and reddish hair. And the yeah. guy says, could you describe more of her body type? Yeah. <laughs> Which, because what we're about to learn is a chandelier fell and decapitated her. Yes. So that there is, is what, no head. That is what, yep. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, and the guy, of course, the guy is like, he's like, I'm just UPS guy. I don't know. But oh my god it's so funny i i i laughed out loud at this moment and which is like how well maybe you dialed the wrong number maybe it's like it's like how do you know this is your mom's number because it's in my phone if that isn't the most 2023 uh -huh. thing like I, does anybody know anyone's number these days yeah you don't miss um, dial yeah you don't miss dial it's like maybe you miss dial. okay okay so hang up read dial, dial your mom's number click ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm so sorry. It's like the first thing he said. <laughs> I laugh so hard because it's it's so unrelentingly dark comedy. Yeah. So we're about to get to, I think my favorite just single scene in this movie because it's confounding. It's weird. It doesn't make any sense. And I loved it. But it's, he basically, he tries to take a bath. The water's back on in the building and he wow. tries to take a bath. Oh, he his pour he pours that he starts the bathtub running when he goes to have this phone call. Yes. So when he gets back, the water is overflowing. He just oh, he's catatonic. He's catatonic. Like like le legit like drops the phone to the ground and does not move. Yeah. Until dark. <laughs> well, he gets in the tub with his phone in one hand, doesn't even look yeah. at it, and sits kind of like Christ like in this tub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then suddenly drops on his face yeah. and he looks up and there is a man on yeah. the ceiling like wedged yeah. into two walls next to him trying to support himself like he's been there the whole day and night and is now yeah, like losing his, steal his apartment or something no i think he was hiding there from people and then is now losing the strength to yeah, hold yeah, yeah, himself yeah, up yeah. i don't know there's no but explanation why? for why no. But I love that he's just there, and, and Bo is showdown. Yeah. Well, Bo is afraid of him falling. The man is afraid of falling. The man finally falls. There is this like naked because wrestling. the brown recluse bites him. That's right. The brown recluse finally shows up on this dude's face, and then he falls into the tub. There's like naked wrestling in the tub. Yeah. Bo manages Dicks to butts b balls. We see a lot of we see a lot of butt cheeks and testicles in this yeah. movie, which. You know, I'm not mad at like no. honestly, like male nudity is weird and a, a, like a source of a lot of anxiety for people. Sure. Yeah. You know, he gets yeah, out of that stop fucking growing at the age of twelve. You know, <laughs> yeah. he gets out of that apartment, runs out into the street. He is naked, naked. yeah, fully naked. Runs into the street. Is then he has to leap over the body. Yeah. He is. Oh, he the other thing. The, the other guy. thing. The other thing he. Earlier in the movie, he before his trip home, he bought a at the like this like little town fair thing. He bought like a little figurine of Mary and yes. Child, yeah, like a little ceramic figurine about yeah. the size of a hum of a male dick of an adult male dick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the size and shape of a dick, uh, but it is Mary holding, standing and holding her baby, and he. Uh, He's carrying this out of the apartment. It's the one thing yes. he thinks to grab. And he's carrying this out of the apartment. And he runs. At, well, one, he sees the stabby guy. Yeah, birthday, he, birthday suit stabby guy. But he steers clear of him and runs into the middle of the street where he then sees a cop. Yes. And the cop is just standing there, like, hitting on some woman. Yeah. And just talking to her on the side of the street and the cops like looking so annoyed to be interrupted. And then he yeah. realizes, oh, it's a naked man holding a thing. Cop draws yeah. his weapon on him. And he's like, drop the weapon. And he's like, it's not a weapon. But he drops it. It breaks. He, yep. And then the cop just says, don't make me do this. Don't make me do this. Do and what? he's like, I... but the other thing is that there's a lot. Listen, Joaquin Phoenix does an amazing job in this uh -huh. film. Like, love him or hate him, whatever. Mm -hmm. But he does a very, like, he plays, like, he does the job. Mm -hmm. But there are so many times where I could not understand what the fuck he was saying. Like, he's so blubbery yes. in a lot of different, I was like, 
And I was like, what the fuck did you just say? What did you just say about your mother? I, but this was one where he's yeah. like, again, it's like at no point in time does this character ever stop like and go, here is my problem. Yes. Which or, is why it does not need to be three hours long. <laughs> yes. Like there's no, this movie is only questions. There's no answers to this movie. No one says, I think your mother's dead. What address does your mother live at? Yes. Or, you know, like there's no like cross. There's like nobody steps outside the perspective of Bo to help Bo in any way because Bo doesn't step out the perspective of Bo to help Bo in any way until he goes to see that fucking play. Right. Of the idealized, the American dream life. You know? Yeah. So he uh, he also is uh, in a series of events that I don't have in order here because I, w- I was watching this in the theater, so I wasn't able to pause and take notes. But there also is Stabby Man shows up, too, and Stabby attacks yep. Bo. Yep. And so birthday you have guy. T- birthday boy Stabby Man, Stab Man attacks Bo. And then as he's trying to get free, he is hit by a van. Yes. End of Act One. End of Act One. Bo is afraid of the city. Done. Act Two. Bo wakes up in a what seems to be a room of a teenage girl. It yep. is covered in. She loves K-pop. She loves K-pop. Another amazing poster that in the in this in the background there is a poster for a K-pop band named Ki Fifty Five. So it looks like Kiss. Okay, so that's the oh, name nice. of the band is Ki Fifty Five. But then the text below KI-55 on the poster says, we are 55 boys and we love you. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. It's so funny. It's so but But then again, it's like I kind of feel like, any, like anybody who is this disconnected, as you said, you know, disassociative of, mm-hmm. you know, being in the world. Like you're always kind of looking for hidden messages and things because you mm-hmm. know they're there. Yeah. Go there there. Yeah. Nothing could be as it seems. Everything no. is cause for anxiety. He's in this cozy bed and he's got uh he's got a little buzzer, a little note that says, yeah. you know, buzz for any reason whatsoever. He's all no, bandaged up. His things. his hands are bandaged. His uh um, you know, yeah, he's he's fully in a hospital mode, but in a teenage girl's bed. Yes. And this is where Amy Ryan as Grace comes in. This is the couple uh played by amy ryan and nathan lane grace Grace and roger Roger. (laughs) i love this this i loved this this act i thought was so smart this is where i kept getting skin of our teeth because it's like okay yeah they are playing like kind of like what wandavision touched on a little you know like they the distillation of the american dream through the american sitcom Mm -hmm. as as like a a band-aid that won't like it like they do, these two actors do such a good job. Like later when Nathan Lane is like, well, gosh, I've got yesterday's surgeries postponed to today and I've got today's surgery. Oh my God, 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 God. like, like a, like a faux argument. And so I was like, what shall, gosh, what, oh, God, da, 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 what shall we do? What shall we do? Gosh, this is a conundrum. I know, like, it's so cheesy. Uh-huh. But the fact of like the stakes are so high that it's like you're a surgeon, you're just pushed back yesterday's surgery. So who the what the fuck kind of surgeon are you? Like if you examine anything they're saying too deeply, it all falls apart. Yeah, but and isn't and that to, suburbia, Jeffrey. It is. Isn't that well, just suburbia? Well, and it's also the mind of of this of Bo in this movie too, because yeah. we realize that they can't be too far outside of the city here. Because they managed to help, you know, help him. They are close enough to have seen what happened to him and take him in to take care of him. Also, the, the his want in this act is to get home to, to his mother's home because his yes. mother is dead and he needs to, to get back for the funeral. So, so there's that. But the drive to mother's house is only a few couple hours away. Yeah. And so it brings into question why did he need a flight when essentially yeah. he's living in New York City and she's living in like Nassau County. Yeah. Or she's living in Boston. 
at, at most, yeah, at Boston, yeah. yeah she it, her house kind of feels very like Hamptons or something like that, or Berkshires yes. maybe. Well, I mean, it's literally called Wasserman. Like yeah. she lives in her own town, Wasserton. She, yeah, Wasserman. Wasserton. Oh, that's it. Yeah, the Wassermans of Wasserton, which is funny coming off of the first town is named Corinna in the state of Corinna. Yeah. Um. Okay. okay. So, 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 so Grace is um. Gosh, Grace seems to have some sort of very important business job. Mm -hmm. Roger is a doctor, which is how they have this IV hookup, right? He's yes. going to fix, he's going to fix Bo right up. They have a teenage daughter called Tony mm -hmm. and to Tony is <laughs> my I favorite fucking love. I mean, like I love Tony because she is horrifying. Yeah, It is literally everything scary about teenagers in uh -huh. one package. Like she never enters a room. She stays silent and sullen. She asks a single pointed question and then just leaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's her MO. Um, oh, and then Jeeves, who is a very large guy who lives in a trailer, which is also like just half a trailer that has been pushed into the house. Did you notice that? Yeah. Yeah. Like in that weird set design, like it's like it's not an actual structure that could stand. It's yeah. like an imaginary structure. But he was he was a Desert Storm vet and he is experiencing some extreme PTSD. Mm -hmm. all the time yeah that the that grace and roger have just sort of yeah oh well, well he's friends with the dead the dead son yes so they the, have the a dead son that is absent yes so they're it probably definitely well definitely not desert storm because they definitely tell us that this is present day and uh this guy's not i don't it wouldn't have been old enough oh, to sure. have served okay. in desert storm. like it feels very much like maybe it was serving in afghanistan oh, okay uh, gotcha but yes, they have this dead son. Uh, I didn't even write down his name, but we'll just call him dead son. We, they have two bedrooms, right? Or this is a three bedroom house. They have yes. the parents' bedroom, they have Tony's bedroom, and they have dead son's bedroom. Dead son's bedroom is off limits to anyone. It has been yes. kept up exactly as it is, which is why they moved Tony to the couch yeah. and allowed uh, Bo to sleep her in room. her room, which is causing even more crisis for her that makes her even mad her matter that she is yeah. uh having to yeah yeah move rooms so they i love this first dinner that they have oh together where they aren't they have all hands together they're not necessarily yeah. praying they're all looking to the the giant portrait of dead yeah. son and the little folded trifolded american flag next to it and there's a sign that's very like home goods type of oh word art. Yeah, live, laugh, wall. love. Yeah, yeah, Live, yeah. laugh, love, but it says, it's never goodbye, always see you later. Right. <laughs> Platitudes. So, but it's, it's so, so good. cringy. And, and the, way Amy, the way Amy Ryan is just like, she is, she is communing with her dead son uh -huh. to the point where her husband, Roger, has to go be like, amen, Grace, amen. And she's yeah. like, yes, amen, amen, amen. Like, there's so many micro moments that, like, in the hands of any other actors, I feel like, like, he got the best of the best. Yeah. In that sort of Broadway way that, like, every moment is actually five moments and you yeah. watch the fucking journey. Yeah. Um. So, as I said, that Bo's MO in this scene is, I've got to get home because my mother's dead and he calls uh, his mother's attorney. Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cohen. And so the idea is, is that um, <laughs> um, her last wish, so that, you know, the Jewish custom, right, like is to bury the body ASAP, right? You bury yeah, the yeah. body as soon as possible. And that, um, but her request yes. was to be buried only when Bo returns. Only in Bo the Bo has of the sun. to be present. And he can't get back. And Dr. Cohen is laying into Bo for the not worst. being there. Yeah. Like that you were never the there for why. But no, 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 no. We'll just wait for you until you get enough time. Like it's the ultimate Jewish guilt trip. Yes. Like, and it's also played by Richard Kind, which which when later that is revealed, it's even more delicious. My favorite is like, so we need you in a suit with a eulogy whenever you decide to show up hangs up i was like ouch damn that is some next level like psychic guilt jujitsu yeah 
there um you know roger is you know, nathan lane's character is you know he's dealing pills like they all have pills they people are eating pills by the fistful this isn't a movie that belabors. he calls them dessert, he calls them it. dessert. Like, time for dessert and pulls out a bottle of pills for everybody i did think at this point that the movie was gonna start belaboring the we take too many pills as a society yeah i think it gets right to the right point of that i think this yeah. movie is filled with so much that it it doesn't get overtaken by we're too pharmaceutical but what, uh, you mean later when tony is literally just taking like a yes. like just like yes. eating pills like popcorn out it's, of multiple bottles it's predominantly in this act that this yeah. happens but uh it's it, yeah she's got whole bottles of pills that are just sure those are your pills you take those pills okay so let's talk a little oh uh, what i was gonna say about roger sorry so roger is essentially saying you can't go home yet you're not yes. healed you've got you yeah. were knifed up by stab man yeah. your your hand your side everything like it's a miracle you're still alive yeah. But you have all these stitches. You could, uh, so many things could go wrong. You can't go home. But as Bo presses this further, it is interesting. Like the next day, Roger and Grace both have to go to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bo is like, but what about my, like, what if my wounds come undone? He's like, it's fine. You don't got to worry yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, it's it's all these mixed messages from, know, right? from people. Let's talk about Jeeves. Oh, Jeeves. Jeeves has clear, like, over-the-top PTSD. Like, almost comedically so? But the dedication <laughs> with which this actor commits to the bit. Mm -hmm. Like, so so at one point, Bo is having the phone conversation with, with Dr. Cohen. You know, he's just getting reamed for not being there. Meanwhile, Jeeves is doing full-on army tactical, like, he is enacting some war play in his brain. Yeah. That involves him like jumping into puddles and like you know, and then like coming out with like like as if he's carrying his his uh his rifle above his head to keep it from getting wet. Mm -hmm. He'll dive into the bushes. Um, at one point he gets a like he runs into a glass plate, and you know of course Grace and Rogers are sort of appear out of nowhere. They're like, oh, that'll be blood. Oh, oh, here we go. Got to give him a shot. Got to give him a shot. Oh, no, no, don't don't worry here. Nothing, to, nothing to be afraid of. Except Jeeves does have a tendency to stare at Bo, usually outside, and says, you're laughing at me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like all he ever says to Bo. And Bo's like, no, I promise you I'm not. I don't. Yeah. Um, there is something menacing directed to Bo. Yeah. There's also a thing that happened that we see at the very beginning of this act when he's in bed is that he has an ankle monitor on. Yes, he does. And Roger kind of dismisses that. It's like, ah, oh, it's just a way to keep track of you, make sure you're okay. Yeah, just check up your heartbeat. You know, it's like just think of it as like um like a wristwatch, like a like a like an iPhone wristwatch. Yes. iWatch. Just so, so it's can track your every movement. So it's interesting because Grace is one of these is an interesting character because she's one of the few people that uh, you know there's a handful of people in this film. Yeah. Handful. I mean, maybe there's only two. There might only yeah. be two people that are really trying at the outset to help Bo, like truly help him. Well, they seem like well, they're in. They're the only ones that acknowledge there's some sort of conspiracy. Because and she, and, yeah, yeah. She and tells him, and, yeah, like, she writes on a napkin, don't, don't incriminate, don't incriminate yourself. yourself. Yeah. And you're like, with what? To whom? By whom? And she tells him, she gives him a uh, a video, or sorry, a, a TV remote when he's in the living room one time and kind of has to encode tell him channel 78. Because when it he, seems like Roger keeps a short leash on on her roger's a company man like roger works for mona yeah and i this reminds this reminded me of kind of the opening segments of firewalk with me because yeah, there's yeah. the video in yeah, the yeah. hall that pa kyle mm -hmm. mclaughlin is obsessed with and this is similar he turns on this video turns to channel 78 and he sees a overhead view of himself right now live in the living yeah. room but it's not just that, like, that's easy to do. You see him moving around the, you know, he moves around the room, sees himself doing the same thing on television on like a half second delay. Yeah. And then he pauses, rewinds yeah. and could see 
backup. Her, you know, yeah, Grace kind of giving the thing. Yeah. And then he hits fast forward. And the fast forward shows him everything that's about to happen there and clips of shit is that hadn't even happened in the movie yet. Yeah. But it will. But it, it will. Does. That's the most crazy because nothing has been like supernatural yet. Everything has been over the top. But that's yeah. a moment where all of time has already been experienced. Like that is yes. a moment of mat that's magical realism at this moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like your your fate, your your whole story has already been written and it mm -hmm. is a tragedy. Sorry, yeah. Bo. There's yeah. no way out. Yeah. So but, she, but, sure, but as yeah. soon as he discovers that, Tony bursts in and she is manic. She is like upset. And this actress, uh, Kylie Rogers, I don't know her work, but she is so good at this because she mm -hmm. is distraught. And sh she has to go into her dead brother's room and paint. They're going to paint the room yep. in pink and blue, which I thought was like, like the choice of that, like light pink and light blue. I was like, is gender, uh -huh. gender uh -huh. is a construct. Uh -huh. We're afraid of gender. Gender is so scary. Yeah. And like, you know, she paints bow in pink all over her brother. And he's like, what, what, why are you doing this? And she's like, he's my, he was my brother. And she's like, Kyle, or she says, Tony, he's like, that's my name. Stop using it. Like, like everything is a recrimination. Everything uh -huh. is, you know, like anything Bo touches, he may, he feels bad about it. He can't do anything. And she says, you and me, we're going to make this right. We're going to drink this paint together. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you he... two chicken shit to go first? I'll go first. And she fucking chugs down this paint. And this is this is where like the horror, uh, like like the audience gasped. Like we as collectively as an audience were like, because it is, it's so it because of the the shocking turquoise nature of the paint, it's almost it's so uh like visceral. Mm -hmm. You know, like it has thickness. It is, it is hard to watch, and it is that paint is everywhere by the yeah. end of it. And it's sure also, enough, it's one of those scenes that made me think how how are they doing this safely with this actor? Because yeah. this is yeah, exactly. a close up of an actual person with paint. It had to have been like a mouth guard or something to just sure. whatever. But oh my god, it's so intense. Uh, she collapses throughout this whole scene. He doesn't yell for help. He doesn't tear the doesn't pain out anything. of her. He no, doesn't Corinne. do anything. No. And no. he is holding her in the arms. And then mom, you know, Grace runs in. Mm -hmm. And this is where Grace snaps, right? Yeah. Grace She's is like, like you, you killed, killed her. Yeah. yeah. And oh my God. And he what... calls for Jeeves. Sick him, boy. Sick him. Yeah, yeah. She and... literally says, like, attack. Next thing, Bo is running. Jeeves is just like he's got like like full flak jacket, knives, gun, grenades, just like you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, just running through the forest like a madman towards towards, towards Bo. Bo. End of he, Act Two. He, he hits his noggin. He hits uh -huh. his noggin on a branch. Uh huh. And the end of Act Two. Now, in yeah. in the in betweens, let's talk about the in betweens because this is where we get into Bo's dream life. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. And Bo keeps having, like, in a very, a lot of this reminded me of hereditary, mm -hmm. kind of, like, in that more, dr like, dream imagery kind of thing. Uh, like, we keep seeing a very tiny, um, like, faraway shot of a woman, uh, you know, like, undoing an attic door. Um, yeah. I think this is where you see, like, Mona, like, a woman clutching her baby, but, like, instead of a hand, she has, like, a talon that's, like, not digging into her baby's brain, but, like, like, monster mother. Yeah. We also see um, from POV shot of someone in a bathtub. Again, the overflowing, the very full bathtub. Mm -hmm. There's a boy who's saying, where's dad? Where's dad? A redheaded woman says, you know, I think you know the answer to that. Like, the most backwards you know like nobody is she cannot communicate anything uh, with kindness or love to her child and nothing Just is like, communicated directly throughout no, most nothing of this at film. all no nothing at all like i think you know where he is i want to see dad oh you want to see dad and she sort of drags him off and but he keeps having the, and every time we get these like in between the city to the the suburbs the you know the play like we kind of get these these dream goes on a little bit longer there's also 
this series of sequences two of mom and Mona and Bo, mm -hmm. young twelve year old Bo or however old he is, yep. and and Mo and young Mona on I think a cruise ship. Are they at a yes. resort yes. or on it's a like, cruise it looks ship? Like a cruise ship. There's also another mother and daughter there. Yes. And this other 12 year old girl, Elaine, Bo is clearly in, you know, in love with this girl. Like yeah. this girl's super pretty and he's looking at her a yeah. lot. And uh, it's a lot of like sinister type of shit with Mona. Like, is that God. the type? Is that your type? That's your is type. That your type. Is that what you like? You know, she seems like the kind who's really self possessed and, um, you know, really like knows herself. And, you know, she would need a man who would, you know, be something. Mm -hmm. but maybe you'll get there someday you know just like uh, like everything this woman says to her child is like cuts him off at the knees yes legit everything is a backhanded compliment and elaine is so this this teenage this teenage girl or preteen girl is is self-possessed yeah. right like she is way more assertive she's yep. super assertive actually yep. uh one would say uh she's way more extroverted or way more action oriented you know they have a moment too where you know she, she basically tells Bo because they're talking. She's like, you know, you are allowed to kiss me. Yeah. And he hesitates. She goes, the offer only stands for 10 seconds. She's like, nine, eight, seven, six. And then at one, like, he finally leans in and kisses her again. Yeah. Moment of agency or whatever. And then apolog is, immediately apologizes oh my for God, it. Immediately apologizes. And then almost cut to, you know, he's in bed, you know, with, it's also so weird. Like his mom is, like, he's like in bed with his mom. And his yes. mom is just like whispering poisoned things into his ear as she is wont to do. And all of a sudden Elaine bursts in and she's like literally being dragged away. And she hands him a photo of her um, because they took, because she was running around the deck saying, there's a dead man in the bot. There's a dead man in the pool. That's right. That's right. There's a dead man in the pool. There's a dead man in the pool. And there so literally was, go. and they took a photo in front of it. And they took a photo of themselves, but it's like her with like the dead guy in the pool behind. And that's her memento. And, you know, this is something we've seen. And he, the, the, what triggers this memory dream is he, I think he catches on TV people reacting to his mother's death. Or no, he logs, oh my God, he logs onto the girl's computer. Mm -hmm. Tony's computer, and, yeah. Tony's computer. And he sees adult Elaine mm -hmm. and he's like, is that the girl that I had a crush on when I was 13 yeah. years old? And Could she worked be? for my mom. That's so weird. Yeah. Cause it's That's framed so... as coworker or whatever. Yeah. But we yeah. don't get any more information. <laughs> no, he, um, <laughs> cause he promptly throws up on the teenage girl's computer. He and totally she's does. Very mad at him. He, uh, in this, um, in these like flashbacks that, that, when when Elaine bursts in to give him this photo, this teen, you know, twelve year old or whatever, gives him the photo. On the back of the photo, it says like "Find me," something to that effect. Yes, and Find he me says, "And and save yourself for me." Yeah, and he says, "I will." Uh, she's being dragged away by her mother. Yeah, who kind of has a similar aura to his own mother. She's oh, more being... working class, kind yes. of like more working class mom rather than like executive class mom. Yes, but same harpy, just a pure har harpy. A harder looking 35 years old, right? And, yeah. um, but you know, and it's okay. So these are all these flashbacks. These are the things that we kind of know. And we've, we've also heard at probably around this point, maybe at the end of Act Three, but we've, we've, we've heard, I think, by the start of Act Three in these flashbacks that dad died yes. as he ejaculated, oh, as he God. finished inside of me, is I think how she says it. Yes. Your father finished inside of me and it killed him. He had a heart murmur, his father before him, his father before him. They all died that exact same way. Oh, I know we know this too. before act three because it becomes important at the end of yeah. act three, but yeah. yes. And, and, and it will happen to you. So you cannot have sex. You can never, you can never, you can never. You can never ejaculate. You can, you and cannot also, this, ejaculate. This is so beautiful. I got to talk about the. This is where you're like, okay, fine. Listen, this movie's three hours, but it's so gorgeous to watch. Mm -hmm. What, like, this horrific monologue that's coming from fake mother, you know, or from, you know, young mother, young Mona is being lit by like a child's like light up mobile. Mm -hmm. So it's like fading color blocks in different colors, like over her face. 
that kind of like, so it's like color blackout, color blackout, color, but you never know what her face is going to fucking look like when yeah. like the range of like, sometimes she's really happy. To, like it is terrifying. It's really it's mask spooky. work. It's masking. Yeah. It's mask yeah. work. It's so good. Because Which, this is how yeah. a child would feel like the like adults emotions are hard to read. Why is mommy mad at me for asking where dad is? And but you see it, it's very childlike and intimate. Like you know that you are a child lying in bed and yeah. you're being told this story about your father dying yeah. while he came inside of your mother, and you're gonna die the same way. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. This is his bedtime story. So act three. Uh, this is where I probably think this is the most close to old school absurdist, you know, theater of the mm -hmm. absurd in the sense that it, the circular logic of it all. I think you're right. You're totally right. It, and, yeah. it, and it's the most theatrical of yes. all of the scenes because it literally is begins on theater. The theater then becomes theater of cinema, which oftentimes uh, when I think of um, uh, Cochinia and uh, I think Cologne are the two mm -hmm. uh, animators names like Wolf House, like that is theatricality for cinema yes. right like animation yeah. like physical animation stop motion that sort yeah, of yeah. stuff but he meets this group called the orphans of the forest yes there's a beautiful woman a pregnant woman in yeah. you know just the richest the richest green uh carrying a lantern yes singing Everything. a lullaby yes uh, I, kind of the the um the sort of pagan version of what a mother should be yeah like soft tender caring strong independent you know like yeah but also very earthy yeah. not you know she's she clear she's she's is she lost she's she's just doing her thing you know she, she has her own a little sad yeah but not devastated no and she helps him she protects him she helps get him uh she offers him uh she's like i have an extra sleeping bag if you need a place yeah. to sleep tonight uh all of these things it's it's super lovely she is very helpful and clearly he is having a mommy connection to her yeah. for what yeah. the reasons you just said but they go to also this is one of these things where i do not remember all of i don't remember any of them but i remember them existing which is there are just like placards on trees that are just yes. quotes yeah, from yeah, musicals yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and i can't yeah. even remember any of them but it's like I no would, it's it's like like always find like you know when you walk through the storm keep your head up high you know like uh -huh. always yeah. chase the rainbow never find the rain like it's real platitude yeah, it's Hashtag great platitudes, platitudes. yeah so he goes to watch their – he gets invited to the, the, you know, the dress rehearsal of this play or performance of this play. And it is about – it begins with this man dressed in, you know, kind of classic uh, 1930s, like yeah. uh, farmer gear. Like he's got suspenders and a wide brim fedora and yeah. dungarees or whatever. And he's – um you know, and this angel comes down. These beautiful trees are turning, oh showing God. the four different seasons as they turn. Yeah. And, and he the, is the, lamenting at the graves of his mother and father. I love the gravestones say mom and dad. Yes. Uh, and as he tries to walk on, the narrator is saying he will then march on, but he is chained to the ground. And the chain, that is a – we open the movie with the umbilical cord, and yeah, the yeah, chain yeah. Uh, visuals go throughout this film. And he has yep. to take the axe and cut himself free. And Bo yep. becomes enamored with this. He becomes in love with this play. And he, the play he is watching is not the play that is happening. The play he is watching, it becomes about him. So then yes. he is suddenly the man on stage. This is all this beautiful stop motion stuff around him, these beautiful it, animations. It reminds me of um, uh, kind of the, op the opening, or not the opening, but like when you're introduced Dorothy to Oz. Like it has that, like burst of color but friendly color <laughs> as opposed right. to like the dangerous color of the city and the sort of absence of color the sort of homogenized color of the suburbs this is like hippie colors to uh -huh. be which listen you know they're theater weird theater people Bo is of course in sort of a faded white light blue because he is human tofu that is his thing um, but like, you know, you have it as your backdrop right now. It looks very handmade. Yeah. These sets like hand painted, hand built. He, uh, envisions this story about a family that is separated by a huge flood 
Yes. And the, he has three. It's about a man, Bo, who yeah. has been separated from his three boys and his wife. And he yeah. spends the rest of his life searching till he is a, a yeah. grizzled, haggard, long haired, long bearded, old, old man. And yes. in his late in his life, he is in a small village and he sees there is a there's a play being done yeah. in the village. He walks up to the play. It looks exactly like the play we were just at, only a little bit more handmade and stylized. Yeah. And he gets there, and the play is a masked woman reading the masks. whole story God. to these three boys who are now adult men, like 30-something men. Yeah. And he stands up in the audience and says, this is my story. You're my sons. And the he boys said. come. He said <laughs> Oh, it's so good. This recursive function shit. I loved it. I because, love because that. The I love it. Because w once he steps through the looking glass, as it were, into the play, which I'd also like to point out, the woman in green also gave him a thermos of something that she's like, here, this will help. <laughs> like, like he's essentially he's tripping out. Right. But the narrator is always you. You will you will walk the land. People will turn you away. You, mm -hmm. you, 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 you. So like you, meaning Bo, but also you, meaning us, yeah. watching the movie, watching the play, you know? So so we get it. So by the time he walks, and I also love the, it's like, soup, $1. Play, my baby boys, $1. <laughs> and he's like, even though it was his last dollar, you decide to go to see a play. Instead and of he, buying the soup instead of buying the suit but it's so brilliant when that moment of like you know he stands up and he's like these this is my story he says this and and all of a sudden he gets folded in and these three boys who are now men come up to him and he get and he also he is he's been made over in a very realistic but very kind of noah biblical mm -hmm. patriarchal big flowing beard you know, healthy, you know, ch rosy cheeks. Like it is very theatrical, but it is very biblical. <laughs> yes. You know? And he's just weeping with joy. My baby, my baby boys, and they're all, they're hugging. And it's all the love that this man does not get in the real world. And one of them says, where is mother? And he says, is mother not with you? No, mother is not with me. I've never had sex. Because if I have sex, I'll die. And the one of the boys says, then where did we come from? And all of a sudden, we are taken out of the world of the play. And that is where Jeeves shows up and starts Well, well hold on, hold on. Shit. <laughs> well, hang on. There's so much more to this. He, yeah, he, um, yeah, they breaks him out of the play. And we are left yeah. with just him standing. Watching uh, the play. It's now just Bo oh, yeah. as he originally was at yeah. the Orphans of the Forest. Oh, yeah, he, we do have something he has to got... get there. Yep. Yeah, he's gotten to the point where he is just standing alone in the audience. Yeah. And, you know, the 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 woman in green next to him is kind of looking at him like, are you okay? Is everything yeah, yeah, good? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, I will sit back down. Another just really moved by this piece of theater, I guess. Yeah, but he clearly had been daydreaming the story of himself. And when yeah. the logic broke in his own story, it snapped yeah, yeah, him yeah. back. Yeah. The other thing about the woman in green, because of his, like, connection like son to mother to her he gives her yes. the uh because she had glued i she um uh grace had found Before, uh, yeah 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 in act two she had found his broken uh mother ceramic the stylized thing. madonna and child yeah yeah had glued it back together so he hands her he hands the woman in green at the play this thing and she is like okay sure thanks but in a moment yeah when shit goes haywire at the end of the scene, she's going to ditch it and run. But yeah. before we get to that, a the man mysterious is, man. There's a mysterious man that we've seen a couple of times in always Act 2. Distance. Always far away. But suddenly he's there. He's yeah. close up. And Bo, the man sort of pretends to be a person who kind of knows Bo and his family. But as the conversation goes on, Bo is now realizing this might be my father. But is he? I don't know. <laughs> There's no reason for him to think that at all. The guy no. even says, he's like, I worked for your mother. Yes. Like, I was a domestic servant. He implies that your father is still alive. Yes. But which, that's it. Which maybe he is. 
Which maybe that is he is a giant the, dick you know, living this, in the attic, stabbing himself. That's right. He might still be in the attic. But it is this thing of like again, like much like the character Grace, like he has this low conspiratorial voice, <laughs> as yes. in like all of these. We're gonna get to this sort of the i this modern idea of NPC of the non-player mm-hmm. character and the sort of desensitization desensitization and the dehuman humanity that we live under as in like this is my story this is the Cecil Baldwin story and anyone else um that i see is just a non-player character and they don't matter yeah maybe they're you know like we get into that sort of thing yeah. um but he calls this guy father mm-hmm. but not before Jeeves shows up and blows everything up yeah, so Jeeves has been tracking him on because his, his ankle monitor. We see yeah. his ankle monitor start flashing. We hear the beep, beep, beep in the woods. On stage, the man who had started the whole play by breaking yes. the chain, the actor, suddenly Jeeves shows up, throws like a knife, and yeah. it just goes through the air right into this man's chest. Pandemonium. A, well, there's a, I was going to say what I loved about the pandemonium that happens is there's a long beat before pandemonium ensues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, yeah, yeah. I think what Ari Aster does so well is showing you the body. is showing yeah. you not just the body, not just the gore. It's about the way we take in the gore. Yeah. I think yeah, about yeah. the couple that falls um, at the beginning of Midsommar, the couple that jumps. Sure. And the kind of the full scene of it yeah. is not just about the the, the graphic gore of bodies hitting rocks from a 25 foot fall but about it places you in the audience it's about the witnessing of it's about the witnessing it's about how gleefully and willingly they jumped off that rock yeah and also how you perceive seeing something because sometimes like seeing a tragedy is more is is an extra level of scary and we see this from the point of view of the audience again Mm -hmm. The camera is sitting in the audience. There's a long beat as people try to wrap their heads around what just happened. Was that supposed to happen? Yeah. And then when they realize it's not, they start screaming. And then this man basically, Jeeves essentially like throws a grenade and blows up father, quote unquote, father. Father. Yeah. And then is opening fire. And it, um, I, I saw this movie the, the same day as the um the allen texas mall shooting sure so may 6th i think that was the day and it was um you know i you know honestly like that's so much in the news of mass shootings and i i was so shocked that it was in this and i was thinking to myself early in this film how all of these the fears were so unfounded like sure, sure. all of the fears and then he hits on a fear that is something that I what if, sit what if with. Your fears. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think about it when I'm in the theater. I think about, yeah. um, you know, I when when we're on tour with Night Vale, like sure. we don't have anywhere close to the same notoriety or uh, uh, made enemies as Salman Rushdie. But Salman Rushdie was stabbed on stage by an audience yeah. member. I, we've never had a fatwa put against us, but no. still. Um, I think about uh, uh, the shooting uh, at the at the um, Eagles of um, what is it? The Eagles of of death metal, uh, oh, the, the, yeah, the yeah. band uh, in Europe that uh, that at a European concert there was a, a gunfire. I just I I think about public shootings all the time. It's yeah. a real fear, and this scene gets the terror because you are in the audience. It's not just about people fighting off the public shooter. Mm-hmm. It's about you being a member of the audience when the mass shooting happens. Like real fear. Like this is what Ari Aster pisses me off about. Like he's really good at it and I salute him, but it also makes me really upset to watch. Because in that moment, do you identify yourself as Bo? As a Bo? Like you, you're like, oh, this fucking guy. Yeah. But you share some similar, Bo is afraid yeah. and you you know, titular. Jeffrey you is afraid. Are afraid. Yeah. yeah, Jeffrey's yeah. afraid. Cecil's afraid. Whoever watched it, like that's what I was saying. It's like a lot of this is like he mines the modern ethos really well for anything that can be turned into a weapon. Yeah, <laughs> against you. Yeah, and it's it's very, but it, this doesn't go on for very long. Like he runs off in a, sh- you know, there's it's there's bullets and he kind of he's running and he's hiding and um, Jeeves dies in a 
strange over the top kind of way because the leader or oh oh my gosh one one of the theater people of course has a gun you know um mm -hmm. which is also like hidden inside the sound machine that made the like the like 50 megahertz that low like wow wow yeah, wow, <laughs> yeah and the which is what they use yeah. which is like what hypnotists use to induce like a light hypnotic state and that's what is going on throughout the entire play which i thought was like fascinating that that's also where the gun came from yes but he shoots jeeves jeeves has got some automatic weapon and essentially is like just firing continually shoots himself um shoots one of the renfair children of the forest but not before he hits incapacitate and Bo is like tased yes and then there's another dream sequence uh-huh and then we move into act four act four so Bo, when he wakes up he hitchhikes the rest of his way to Waterton, Wasserton, home of you notice, like, Mona Wasserman. The, like, it's so funny how, like, hitchhiking is, like, the scariest thing you could possibly do. And yet, he has, like, another sort of middle-aged, silver-haired, like, very straight-looking gentleman. As, as, like, it's, like, the nicest. Like, yes. So of course, you know, some executive just shows, like, oh, oh, okay, oh, well, I can be safe here. Yes. I, I'm, I'm around, around other other men of a certain kind. Oh, this is fine. So he, uh, yeah, it's it's totally incongruous to how this would happen. Like a man like that is not picking a man who looks like yeah, Bo up no, on the side of the road. No. So he makes it to his mother's house, but he realizes they went on with the funeral without him. Yep. He wasn't there for the funeral. Again, another fun little Easter egg is the catering people are all clearing the dishes out and loading it to the back of the truck. Did you see the company name and slogan on this it's, truck? It's uh, it's it's Shiva, like Shiva, Shiva Steves. Shiva, Shiva Steves. Steves. That's it. Yeah. No, I did notice that one. And their slogan like, is "Grub for the grieving." Oh my god, so I love it. But love this it. was also what if this is where because I, you know, I was pretty good to clock when he fast forwards in time. One of the one of the scenes you see is of caterers putting away chairs, and this is one. So we know. Yes. All of a sudden, the you know the the movie is the the seams of the movie are starting to show themselves, or have shown themselves to Bo and to us. Yeah. So we know that this is all predestined. <laughs> yeah. The um, he. <laughs> what is this house, Jeffrey? Okay. So the, well, this house is like an architectural wet dream, right? It's so much happening. Open but open floor plan. A very open floor plan. Also. The other thing about this house is it has uh has several levels to it. There's a there's a central like open air spiral staircase. Yeah. But also in some of these open areas where it did there's like a little plant area that's lowered yeah. by like six feet from the living yeah, room. Yeah. There's no guardrails around a lot of it. No. That it it is it is an accident waiting to happen. In fact, one of the yeah. scenes we saw on the fast forward to videotape is him sitting on a kind of a high ledge with no railings. Yes. While yeah, yeah, yeah. he's contemplating seeing the open casket of his mother, like the open casket funeral. So he finds his way to the casket, open casket. It is a woman's body, hands tucked nicely on her belly, on her chest. In a white dress. In a white dress and no head. Open casket. Open casket, headless. Every single person in the audience laughed at that point. Because it's so, <laughs> this is absurd. This is like truly absurd. Mm -hmm. um, because it's so dumb. Like if if somebody died by decapitation, you don't have an open casket funeral. But in this world in which everything is run by, you know, the mother, the fear of the mother, of course, yeah. she wants him to see it. She wants him to see it. Yeah. Um, and he... I also love that. I, I love the fact that he missed the funeral, but like one of the cater waiters is like, oh yeah, there's just a like video on loop. So he doesn't get the funeral, but he has to passively listen to other people talking about the, the legacy of his mother. Yeah. So he doesn't even get to participate in his own grief. Yeah. So he... He's sitting in the house contemplating all of this. We will learn in just a, you know, a, a little down the road, like four or five hours into this film, <laughs> this super long film. Four or five hours. We, yeah. we will learn. Uh, we will learn that at this point, he knows his mother is still alive. 
he yes. it, it had occurred to him by the time he arrived at the house he knew but yeah. he is he's at the house and he hears somebody come up and it is elaine this is parker posey mm -hmm. it is elaine adult elaine who has been late to the funeral um and she's just like she doesn't recognize Bo. she's like i just i was supposed to leave flowers i don't know whatever yeah sorry to bother I guess I'll you leave them here she I'll owes just, me money she owes uh, me money i'll get I'll, out of here I'll get an Uber. Let me get back. an Uber. Yeah, let me get another Uber, which I love. Like that is the most like, well, I just got one. Fuck, let me just wait for another. Like it's so of the moment. Uh -huh. This satire. I yeah. thought I thought it was great. So he uh he's like, but hey, by the way, it's me, it's Bo. And she's like, Oh my God, yeah, totally. You uh he says, Oh, I love this. He says, Elaine, you look exactly the same. She goes, So do you, except for your face and hair. No, face and body. Face and body, that's it. Except for your face You look face exactly the body. same, except for your face and body, which is different. <laughs> He's like, thank you? But, but they she's... kiss. They kiss. They, they, have a, she... they have a moment. He's like, oh, I wait. He says, I waited for you. And she says, I wanted you to wait for me. And they walk back in and she says, bedroom. Yes. Where? And uh, he leads her up to Mona's master bedroom. Does this movie have mommy issues? Who Does even it? knows? Who knows? What, what even are mommy issues? Um, so they, she's like, you, and it's so weird. She's like, kind of like absent mindedly, like digging through dead, fake dead Mona's stuff and like trying on earrings. Like, she's like, oh, just go into the bathroom. I'll be ready in a minute. As if like she's like pilfering the place. It's just uh -huh. her, and it's Parker Posey. So of course it works. Like everything she does is like fresh and amazing and natural and funny and quirky. But like he's all in course of really embarrassed. He mm -hmm. even comes out and she's like, Why aren't you naked? You're not naked. And he's like, Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he strips down to his boxer briefs and like runs like a 12-year-old going into the showers or out of the showers, jumps in bed, and they start doing it. And and he and he start he's oh, he's gonna come. Uh -huh. But he knows if he comes, he's going to die. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also uh do you remember Roger, Nathan Lane, said, oh, yeah, while that guy was stabbing you and I ran you over with my truck, I did notice that one of your testicles looked a little bit distended. So we should make sure and check. Like, it's all the doctor phobias that come with having a body. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, granted, like, the implication is his balls are so full. <laughs> yes. But you know what? He comes. Mm -hmm. And literally parker posey she's like i felt that i think mm -hmm. you broke through the bag with that and he's like and he's and he's like laughing mm -hmm. with joy because he's like i'm not cursed i i didn't and he looks up and parker posey is frozen and her she has like blood in the interior of the white of her eye mm -hmm. and she's dead yeah frozen so he stiff her. yeah like she is Fro in full rigor mortis Cat catatonic mm -hmm. but it's like he's killed her by fucking her. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, God, what was the song? Um, it's not weak in the knee. It's not. It's not SWV. But there is like some, like the most popish, like romantic love song is still going. Everything is so romantic, and he like pushes her off, and she stays frozen in that position. Yeah, when the when the servants of the house come to pick her up, she just is. They pick her up and just kind of hold her two people upside yeah. down. Her hair is waving, dangling, yeah. but the rest of her body is like a statue. It's yeah. mesmerizing. The Again, NPC. That. It's like it's like she's a glitch. She's been glitched. Yeah, she. It, this scene was so confounding because I didn't understand what happened to her. I wanted a logical yeah. explanation for. I get like logically it makes sense that she died, even though that's illogical, I suppose. That's completely but like ridiculous, it's but okay. Super ridiculous, yeah. but why was she frozen like a statue? Yeah. Like that if was she the had crazy a brain part. aneurysm or something. Yeah, why? But I think but NPC looks... glitch is such a good way yeah. of putting it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. from out of the shadows comes Mona. Emerges mother. And it is Patty Lapone, ladies and gentlemen, Patty Lapone. Patty Lapone. My kink is Patty Lapone being absolutely vicious to me. Oh my god! <laughs> like, all right, you think you you saw? Listen, my my uh, I actually was at opening night of Lapone Gypsy, 
because Whoa. a college friend of mine was in the cast and he got me a ticket. He had they had like two tickets and I went and I literally sat in between Victor Garber and Stephen Sondheim. What the fuck? Yeah. And listen, I gotta say, when she sang Rose's turn, time stopped. Yeah. Like legit. Like I have witnessed it. Like for the full seven minutes that that song went on, all of time stopped. And uh, as soon as it ended, every single person stood up on their feet and applauded. So I've witnessed the power uh, of Patti Lapone in person. I've only seen her once on stage, and it was in Terrence McNally's master class. <gasps> oh, my God. And, See, and she, I was... she was amazing. Yeah. However, it is not a musical. No, it's not. So I have not seen her sing live and in oh, person. Oh, yeah. Um, um, it, yeah. It, and in this, all I can say is Patti Lapone is playing um, – do you remember what we said about hereditary? She is playing high Greek tragedy. Yes. She is playing Clytemnestra. She is playing Medea. Mm -hmm. It is royal because, you know, this character of Mona Wasserman is set up as the self-made woman. She built a company, a company which, by the way, seems to implicate her in the downfall of all of Western society. Yeah. Yeah. Like she's the one who's gotten everyone addicted on drugs. She's the one who's made the inner cities into slums mm -hmm. and has made these sort of living centers, which are clearly slums. Like it's so skid of like I know I know Thornton Wilder is so old fashioned, but it it has that that silliness to it. Yeah. And that silliness reveals very serious things. And and Mona is there. She is the architect of all this. And she just begins to lay a guilt trip on him like you couldn't even wait until my body was cold to fuck your slut girlfriend in my bed. Uh-huh. And he he mentions the dream that's just which we yes. heard at the beginning. Uh that he because mentions I didn't to put this therapist. together. I didn't put this together. <laughs> And listen, we're oh, take it, Jeffrey, because th well, this is the big reveal if there okay. is one in this film, I guess. Well, he had mentioned this dream, and we had seen all of these dream flashbacks of like this yeah. bathtub and this other thing, and also the attic of what's the in the spirit. attic. And she's yeah. like, Well, that wasn't a dream, you idiot. It was you, it's a memory. You yeah. should know the difference between a dream and yeah. a memory. I'm like, Well, <laughs> thanks, pharmaceutical mother. I but... know, right? Yeah, for real. <laughs> um, so we now get to see the scene happen in real time, which we've seen little clips of from his dream of almost like a diorama look of yeah. a woman opening a ceiling ladder to an attic, like a classic and it's shaped and it's shaped like an oblong house. Yes. It's so hereditary. It's like the micro, mm -hmm. like it, like it's, ha it's also very being John Malkovich. It's like, yeah. if you found a little elevator that went to the third 33rd, the third floor, Mm -hmm. And it got off, and you could go through into that little weird office building that Charlie Kaufman made, and you go into <laughs> John Malkovich's head. Uh -huh. This is Ari Aster's version. And what's in Mommy's attic? Well, one is this weird... There's a brother, right? He has this... Is it a brother? Is it him? I is think it... it's him. Yeah. Because uh, one of those weird dream sequences on the cruise ship... Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we see Elaine come talk to him uh, -huh. uh <laughs> i had gotten up to go to the bathroom when this scene happened so when i got oh, back shit. my friend was like uh i do need to tell you there is another boy <laughs> there that's just like him um and so when we get up to the attic we see a man who looks like Bo, who's Bo's age long hair sitting in the attic but he quickly so not only does he have the secret twin brother or whatever this thing is yeah but then that goes away so fast because so what fast. overshadows that is like an eight foot tall penis and balls with, with, a with, with sharp like, teeth and evil eyes angry, and like pincers. angry like pince pincery yeah. type arms that look like a they look like the front legs of a praying mantis yes basically Just and going, it is Rah, and on. yeah, it's doing silly Muppety gestures, but the Muppety gestures are it using those front claws to stab its own nuts. Yes. Yep. Over and over and over again. Now, I want to go back to this, the, the schism, because I think what Ari did with the giant dick monster mm -hmm. is it's a bit of like 
the real story got overshadowed by that. And she says, that's your father. <laughs> oh, big reveal. That's yeah. your father. But I think what's more interesting and what kind of like, as I saw this movie in the, the, the hours and days after it, I was thinking about this other character and essentially this is my take. Um, when he was young, the dream sequence that he keeps repeating over and over again is a moment which he says, where's father, you know, where your father is. And he's like, I don't, she's like, your father's dead. And he's like, I want my father. And Ma and Mona leads her son, and she's like, and, and I think she even says something to this, uh, this effect. She's like, I put him, you, the, the bad child, the child that dare talk back to his mother in the attic and forgot about him. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a brother as much as it's a part of him yeah. that could stand up to her. I think you're it's, right. And yeah. And then we kind of get a little bit like as we get into the courtroom trial sequence, it's the, it's the it's and it's become emaciated. It has an empty bowl. It's just going again. It's going help me, help me, help me like mm -hmm. every other character in this movie. Mm -hmm. But I think that's like in the psychological attic of things that we put away to be looked at when we're very old, like memories, like, mm -hmm. you know. Like nostalgia, we pull out, you know, things that are kind of maybe a little broken, you know, put them in the attic and forget about them, right? Yeah. As opposed to bury them in the basement and hope we forget about them. Yes. Um, but I think that's the part of him that if he had been an integrated person in a realistic way and not had a, you know, a living Greek tragedy, like Hydra monster of a mother, that is the part of him that would have made him into a a complete man, a complete person. Yeah. It's his, it's his backbone. It's his, it's his ego. I don't know. I'm, I don't know psychology that well. Yeah. But it's become so sad and sick and his mother has captured that away and has turned him into what he is. So outside of the attic, this is where we learn the other big reveal that he is kind of known. And we've sort of known since maybe we started thinking about since act two, which is the whole thing has been staged by Mona. Yes. Like his therapist shows up at her yeah. house like she was he was part of this and and, and he other... shows up like he was in the bathroom the whole time did you get that it's yes, like people, yes people come and go so straight like you hear a toilet flush and his and his therapist with a with a permanent grin on his face uh -huh. just walks out of the toilet as in like was he here when he was fucking parker posey as well sure has he been laying in wait the whole time the answer is yes <laughs> yeah and and you know what's really it's so fascinating because we're about to have in this conversation with uh, Mona and her son uh, and Bo, you know, her talking about all of the things he's done wrong as a yeah. son. And what's funny is, is that like she brings up stuff that happened in therapy, which makes sense. Yeah. But when you reflect back on how that therapy session went, that her that therapist was like egging him on totally to say nasty words things mouth. about mother. Yeah. Remember when he said. Listen, I don't want to call her a poisoned well, but would you? And he's like, uh, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Leading the witness, I say. And, she, and not only that, but yeah. she's playing it on like a hi-fi sound system. Yeah. Which is like, just like the most, and this is what Bo is kind of experiencing, this sort of betrayal of like, I can't, like, I. this is supposed to be confidential. Yeah. He, um, but don't, but don't all, but don't all middle-aged, you know, Western men kind of think that they're betraying their parents when they talk about them poorly in therapy. I, Isn't that it, the fear that keeps yeah. a lot of people away from therapy? What's well, the fear that your therapist is one has an alternate agenda, but more importantly, yeah. that your therapy would be made public to the people you're talking about, right. that you're talking about your spouse or your child or your parent or, or your best friend or your boss, right? right. That like, yeah. what if, uh, shit, I, I found this therapist through my company health, ma health right. manual. Do they report they're to secretly my boss? taking note? That yeah. would be Scientology, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, he, um, she essentially, she has the receipts on everything yep. he's ever done. And she has singled out all of the things that are wrong to have done. Yes. As opposed the to CD, the CD yeah. gift. Oh my God. God it's and so it all terrible. happens at the age of 12. It's all at that age when his, like, when I think his psyche schismed, you know? Well, he, he, um, 
What's happening over there? Oh, okay. sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, I just saw you have an intense look off. No, I just got a, like a weird alert on my oh, okay. computer. Um, well, it, it, to be real pop, pop psychologist here about this is the way his mother in those scenes when he's 12 and mom is just laying in bed with him. Like there's nothing, uh, there's nothing like overtly sexual about these scenes, but there is this attachment thing that happens with single mom, single son sleeping in the same bed yeah. being like, there's this fully Oedipal thing that is, yeah. they cannot be without each other and they yeah. still maybe see each other as part of the same body. Yeah. And so by him falling in love with another, with a girl mm -hmm. and sort of like pledging his faithfulness to her, like Betrayal. I will come, I will come find you. That is him saying, mother, I don't love you anymore. Yes, that is what done. she hears because there can only be one mother. Mm -hmm. You cannot find another mother. And she knows about him handing the little statuette over to the woman in green in the forest. Like it's another betrayal. If you found another you want that mother? Go get her. Like, uh, yeah, you yeah, can't, yeah. you know. So he then basically says, not says, he basically chokes her. He yes. reaches up and starts choking her to the point where she collapses into like a, a an aquarium or whatever that was. I know, which th this was the point in which someone in the theater went literally went, oh, Jesus. Because this aquarium, like this terrarium, exists only terrarium. for Patty Lapone to fall into it. it does, like yeah. it is so packed. Yeah. It, it is it like, which makes sense because everything in this movie, much like theater, it mm -hmm. only like you know you don't nothing exists in this movie extraneously. It is all there for some silly reason that supports this construct that well, mother is everywhere and, and an argument could be made that none of this actually happens no. at all in the film no. like it is a, it is a movie that it is that 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 you know that, that life and death are one in the same thing yeah. two sides of the same coin and he doesn't again to to his true character he doesn't kill her he chokes yeah. her stops panics apologizes and leaves the house and says i'm sorry mommy i'm sorry I'm sorry mommy. I'm sorry mommy as opposed to you know what you actually can kill this woman because yeah, the world could. thinks she's dead no one will come looking for her body because yeah. it turns out that the body was she paid off the family to donate of one of her servants to donate yeah. this woman's body to become the dead corpse of her yes okay Bo, outside of the estate gets on a motorboat on yeah. the water and starts riding this yeah. motorboat and he enters a cave. Oh my god. Do we have some do we have some vaginal imagery to all of vaginal this? Vaginal imagery. Like it is do you remember I, I remember this was the joke in high school with me and mm -hmm. my friends. We were all very kind of smart literary, you know, AP students. Mm -hmm. And we all laughed that uh, after reading Huckleberry Finn when our teacher tried to say, oh, the cave is an allegory for rebirth. So, like, he goes in the cave, is reborn. And and we joked, like, trying to find, like, a birth allegory in everything now. And I was like, well, here we go, Huck Finn. <laughs> yeah. But he goes through this cave. And for one moment, it's so beautiful. It's him on a moonlit sea, stars in the sky. And he has no past. He has no future. He has no destination. He looks at peace. Mm -hmm. And then the motor breaks. And then and the, the motor, motor starts to malfunction. And he is inside a giant circle in the square. Yeah. He's, he's in circle in the square. Yeah. I was thinking Madison Square Garden. He's just in this huge arena. Um, I was actually getting old, like, gladiator coliseum oh, type of yeah, vibes. Yeah. I it was waiting like for that. a super giant fish monster to come and he's going to have to fight it or whatever. But or like a monster truck or yeah. Yeah. Like it, it feels like that. But it's there's... arena theater, which there's a difference between proscenium theater and arena theater. Uh -huh. Arena theater, circle in the square, arena in DC. You must not only watch the play, but you must watch the other people mm -hmm. watching the play. And it is that. This and, scene... Oops, his whole life is a play. His whole uh -oh. life is a play. And this is the trial scene. Uh, I, I do want to say this. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned this director before. Roy Anderson, uh, uh -huh. who is a Swedish director. If you have a chance to go see, to watch You, the Living, 
or a pigeon sat on a branch uh, pondering its own existence, I think is the complete title of that film. Um, I would highly encourage you to see these movies in the realm of they are like they're Swedish Wes Anderson, um, but even more quiet and existential. They're not as horror ish. But what Roy Anderson does is everything he shoots is on a sound studio so he can paint backdrops. He can create um, this crazy depth of field that everything looks far away, but painted on up close, you know, if that makes any sense. And that's what this this arena kind of has that vibe of the audience kind of doesn't move. You talked about NPCs and video games. This is a little bit like the just backdrop of we've just painted on a crowd in the background. Yes. In which, in which everybody's kind of like moving, like does small movements enough to make you go, oh, there's movement back there, but it's not real human uh-huh. movement. Uh, also, this also mirrors when he's looking at, you know, morning Mona. Um, there's this like what one of those pictures in which there's multiple small passport photos <clears throat> of people and they make up a larger photo of Mona's smiling face. Mm-hmm. And he gets real close up to that and notices there's the Asian guy with all the tattoos that hated him in the first act. Uh-huh. There's Elaine. You see other NPC characters that you have watched throughout this huge psychodrama that are all make up Mona. So yeah. in other words, Mona is all. Yeah. <laughs> she is everything. Mother is everything. And, you and I think there's, her. there's definitely kind of circles of conspiracy theory groups uh, that we'll talk about that what if all of our life is just a simulation, right? Like there's oh, yeah. kind of the joke of- Red, blue, when, blue, blue, blue pill, matrix. Yeah, yeah and when something yeah. breaks down and, and doesn't seem right, everyone's like, oh, the simulation needs to be rebooted or whatever. Right. Um, but this movie, well, Devin, I mean, I, I'm i not into that realm that much. I'm vaguely, only vaguely aware of it. So I don't want to spend any time talking about it. You're not trying to find lizard it. people? No, I, I don't want to spend any time talking about that conspiracy. But I do think- this movie touches that pretty yeah. heavily, especially with that photo, that that yeah, photo yeah, yeah. collage of Mona. Like, what if everyone you knew? It, it, in this moment, I was like, "This is the weirdest episode of the Truman Show I think I've <laughs> yeah. ever seen." Truman Show is right there with it. That's another movie that its climactic final scene is takes place in an arena when you become aware of the sky yeah. as the dome that everything's painted onto. Except so, that was Daddy Issues. Yes. And this is like this. I mean, really, it really is like the absentee godlike father. Mm-hmm. This is the all consuming, controlling mother. Yeah. So this is Mona and Dr. Cohen, who is his, who is her lawyer. Yeah. And it is a trial. I love that he has a defense lawyer. I know. That is under a, under a sign. This is 1 800 defense. And this guy is not miked. Whereas, and so he has to shout everything while Dr. Cohen is on this platform that's almost extending out to be seen by everyone. Whereas the defense lawyer is in the alcove that is barely visible. Everything about this is hilarious and sad. And And of course, you know, mother Mona is like, you know, like a queen, like, like fucking Evita, you know, is, is on there. And it's just like, you get to see the indignant. She, she is just, just so stone faced that she even has to deign to look at her son, this terrible, terrible thing. And he's like, we're now going to, let's go to the clips. We now have some videos. Here's a few clips that we have of. On a jumbo drawn. Yeah. yeah, On the jumbo draw. Oh my God. Which they lower. I love that. Again, it's like little things that is, are great, but like in the moment you're like, what the fuck is that? You hear a like whirring sound and you see a grid lower and you're like, this could literally be anything. And then it turns out to just be a jumbotron on which, but it's like a full 10 seconds of what the fuck is that thing? Oh, that's mm-hmm. what that thing is. Yeah. But we see videos of young Bo um, in a mall, mm-hmm. hiding from his mother, overjoyed that she's losing her mind, wondering where her child is. And then she slips and falls and tears, tears her, her MCL or tears whatever. her tendon. And he and they're like, what? What child would do? Like, it's so. If it wasn't so stupid, it would be serious. And if it wasn't so serious, it would be stupid. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But they're playing it full full tilt. Like, yeah, it, it's it's like devil's advocate here. Like, she is the devil, and this is her lawyer, and she is out to get it. She wants every moment 
aired in the court of yeah. her son's failings. Yeah. Well, the, also the the defense attorney is trying to mount some kind of comeback, some type of retort, but then people just show up behind him, grab him, and throw him onto the rocks below, and he's yes. dead. <laughs> and Similar so... to just like hereditary. Yeah, yeah. they're like, uh, your lawyer. Yeah. Yep. Taken care of. Um, he finally sort of uh, you see it on his face. He's going to have to. Oh, I know what it was. He um. When he tries to like, when Bo is trying to, you know, fend for himself, he is trying to get out of the boat because he the yeah. motor is still like kind of exploding and fizzing and whirring, yeah. and he his feet are stuck to the yeah. boat. He cannot. He's like the man with in the play that he is chained to the ground, um, and he tries one last sort of appeal, and then we get a wide shot of Bo. I had to like. I wished I could have rewound this. I know. This I know. This was, this so was an fast. odd moment. It's an odd moment. Essentially, the motorboat, what I understand happens is the the boat, the motor on the boat finally blows up. The whole thing capsizes and traps him yeah. underneath. Yes. And he is drowning and we can hear him. It's just a yeah. wide shot. We can see the whole arena. We can see the little yeah. two bits of uh, Mona and Dr. Cohen. Yeah. And in amongst the crowd, and we hear him kind of calling and calling and saying things, and then eventually he just goes silent, and the credits just are rolling. Yeah, during this whole time. Meanwhile, the NPCs are watching, and slowly, I love it that as soon as he, as soon as the explosion happens, people start to leave. Yeah, climax. Bo is dead, or it's not even like we think we just we know Bo's going to die, so they don't even just stay. It's like leaving the baseball game. Because you know, you're up like, by seven in the ninth. Yeah, inning. yeah. You're, you're like, like, we can leave. We can go. We home. know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, he's going to die. But like, and legit, the exact. It, it's that weird simulacrum of life and art in which you're like, is there going to be? Is is there anything else? No. Should I stay for the credits? Uh, yeah. Well, the people on the movie screen are all leaving, and I waited until you know. There's a moment which like all the major credits happen, and legit, everyone in that theater sat in their seats. Uh huh. I think somebody said audibly to the point where I could hear them said, so they gave Ari Aster a bunch of money and he made a David Lynch movie about mommy issues. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. I'm out. He made us pay to watch his therapy. Yes. He did. Um, is the most it's cynical a... way I could talk about. It. I love this movie. I loved a lot of, I, I loved a lot of this movie. I loved um, a lot of it, but yeah. it's like, you gotta, you gotta, it's an uphill climb. It is. And he does, you no favors. He doesn't. Uh, the other thing that you can hear in the credits is uh, every now and then you can hear sobbing. Um, oh. Or what I thought, what I, that's what I thought I was hearing. Oh. Yeah. Um, I could be wrong about that. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I just me... sounded like, it sounded like post-theater murmur. Yeah. This you know? also, to bring up another filmmaker, uh, Michael Haneke, or Haneke, yes. who did yeah, Funny yeah. Games. He did a film called Amour. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this. I know I've it, not. I've not seen it that is one. beautiful, stunning. I love this movie. Uh, it's not a movie I want to watch again because it is a hard fucking watch because it is yeah. real horror, not horror horror. Oh, gotcha. But it yeah. is about a an older couple and this woman has a stroke. Okay, oh, and no. it and and it is their life together after that. Ooh. So it is it is about being old with somebody yeah, yeah, you love yeah. and watching yeah, them and yeah, taking yeah. care of them and blah blah blah. But the movie opens with them, you know, before she has the stroke and they're at a play or they're at a they're at a concert, uh, uh, opera, whatever it is. I don't remember. But the movie opens with, oh, they're at the cinema, I think is what it is. Yeah. The movie opens with a direct on camera shot of people in a cinema watching a film. Oh, my God. Yes. Which like, immediately uh -oh. puts you in line with this is you. Yeah, you yeah. are them. And so the whole movie from then on, you feel I'm this this is a real fear to have in your life that yeah. someday I will be this woman or I will be this man, both really terrifying. And so the sorrow hits you harder because at the get go, he's like, This is you. You're watching movies. You're gonna get old. Yeah. yeah. You watch movies, so you do these things. Yeah. So what is the implication here? That we are all Mona? We are Ma all implicit in the death of our children or like that's a what? fantastic question. I think that I think for Ari, for Ari Aster is, I think he likes, like I said earlier, I think one of his devices, one of his tricks, uh, and I love this as part of his voice, 
I think he likes in horror is placing you in the audience. I think he likes giving you a wide shot. You know, when we yeah, talked about in Hereditary, maybe. the scene where Gabrielle Burns uh, character burns up, like yeah, catches yeah, yeah, fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a wide shot. It is yeah. a full body shot of both of them in the room together, side by side, like a diorama, but also you're witness to this. You, He wants yeah. to place you as witness, not just as an audience member in a film, but in real life, you are standing there seeing tragedy. It's not a bird's happen. eye view. It's not the taxi driver god view. You yeah. are, yeah, you're a bystander. Well, I just think about you're like, okay. to do anything. If you imagine, let's do a horror scene. Imagine a plane crash. Yeah, now yeah. imagine that you are standing in a public area. You are at an air show and you watch a plane crash. Yeah. Now imagine a plane crash, but you're on the plane. Those yeah, are two yeah. different levels of horror. So different. So totally different. And I think that that's what he wants here is to not get us too close to what is happening to Bo and not get us too close to what's happening with Mona. We're not Mona. We're not Bo. We're in the audience and we're witnessing this because we've dissociated from whatever yeah. character we are. We're not allowed to be Bo because we've disassociated from our protagonist. of this Even film. though we have watched his journey from birth to death. And he has too. From and he his was, point of view. And he was never in his own body either. You know, no. so in some ways we are Bo outside of Bo's body. Um, we are just as detached. Yeah. We are as, like, we are as detached from the action on the screen as Bo is from the action in his own life. Yeah. Let's rate this film. What do you yes, say? Let's. How approachable is this movie on our Sasha scale, the squeamish approachability scale for the horror averse? On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not at all approachable, don't go near this if you're squeamish, 10 being super easy, you can do it. I would give Bo is Afraid 6 penis monster father figures out of 10? I would say it's mostly dark comedy more than horror. But man, it's it's upsetting. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's shit's upsetting in this movie in a deeply existential way. We, we, we did existentialism. We got yes, existentialism. We and um, I would say it's, oh, another similar movie to this that I would say is The Coen Brothers, A Serious Man. Um, and, oh, or, or Barton Fink. Or Barton Fink, absolutely. And the way they use horror in their yeah. films, yeah, yeah, yeah. this movie is like that except more heightened. Um. Uh, everything everywhere all at once is another recent kind of absurd yep. just everything but you know everything bagel of a movie literally yeah, 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 everything yeah, yeah. bagel yeah. and um yeah I, but you know this one is the horror movies uh i'm sorry the horror elements in this movie are really strong when they happen the feet in the shadow below the door uh jeeves just at a distance staring at oh, Bo. Right. yeah that's freaky that shit's really freaky um stab man when he actually start yeah. stabbing people it's, is like the blood looks real and shocking and yeah, the mass shooting much. in the forest theater these are really hard things so uh and then obviously this movie deals almost entirely with mental illness so um i i know that uh trigger warning for suicide and dissociation we've talked a lot about those today um those are a present uh, gaslighting and gaslighting Ooh, Which it, this movie is like the definition of gaslighting yeah 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 uh th that ch gaslighting as child abuse basically yeah so all of that being said yeah approachability six out of ten like if you're just really worried about slasher movie type of horror um you're gonna be fine uh but um yeah it's it's it's, it's a tough go at, at times cecil as a horror film what do you think uh, you know, as a horror film in the canon of horror films, this one's going to rate a little bit lower because, yes, I would definitely say this is dark comedy. It's not even gallows humor. Like, we're dealing with, like, skeletons and, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. This is just dark humor. Yeah. Um, which can be, it's more tense than scary because it never really, like, the, the kettle never comes off the, the hot plate. Yeah, you know the the whistle never gets the, never goes down because it is a constant whistle of the phones are ringing, somebody's at the door, the kettle is on, and you have to make a decision. You can you know like and it's that anxiety which is horrific to some, um, and very effectively done. But I'm gonna give this like a three, uh, three, um, three do it all pills <laughs> out of a bottle of ten. Yep, out of a bottle of ten. You have to drink it with water. You must drink must. it with water. And the doctor says so. And if you fuck up, then you might die. Let's and figure your out what will be disappointed. <laughs> Let's figure out what movie we will watch next. You have a scared die. I have a style die. 
we'll roll those up and see what matches, what film matches these two things. So if you roll a one, Cecil, our next scare is Animal. Two, Alien. Three, A Lady Killer. Four, Killer Games. Five, Evil Science. Or six, A Wild Card. Whatever scare we want. That's a four. Killer Games. Let's play a game. I will roll for style of film. So if I roll a one, it's got to be a found footage feature. If I roll a two, it's got to be an action fantasy type of movie. If I roll a three, something in black and white. Four, something that is body horror. Five, a bottle movie, something that is a single location film. Or a six, uh, something uh, 75th percentile, something that is 75% higher on the review aggregator site. So let's see what we got here. Oh, that went off the table. Let's try that again. That is a five. I've got bottle movie and deadly Ooh. games. Oh, we have a lot of good options here. Oh, uh, yes, we do. Okay, so let's start with the ones we put on our list, and then we'll check in on what Letterboxd has to say. So uh, I put on here Hush. Maybe yes. not quite a game, but that, well, you know. It's that, Cat that and Mouse. It's, it's, it's cat a true mouse. Cat and Mouse. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a literal game. Like, it's no one is saying, let's play a game I don't believe in this movie, yeah. but it is Cat and Mouse. Uh, I love this movie. This movie is like a sleeper hit horror fave in that it's two characters, super simple theory, super simple premise, script is tight, actors are both good, in, out, bish, bash, bosh, kind of the opposite of what we just saw. Yeah, and uh, Mike uh, Mike Flanagan is amazing. Uh, yeah. That, that's, yeah. So, uh, all right, so that's, that's one on here, Cabin in the Woods. Sure. It's a, it's a bottle movie. It is sort of a game in terms of game show. What are we dealing yes. with here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, game show is actually pretty, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, Funny games, bottle movie, literally yep. they are playing games. With They're like, the... you cannot escape unless you play this handsome psychopath's game that might involve your family. I don't know. Uh, Circle? Okay, Circle is one that I found. Um, Circle is one, it's it's like um, a bunch of strangers in some unknown space in which it's like, there's like a hundred people and they have to essentially vote people out to die to go to the soil to be made into soil and green we don't uh -huh. fucking know but it's one of those like high concept high style almost like if 12 angry men were made into like a sci-fi dystopian future kind of things okay um yeah i'm pretty sure is wait let me double check that am i describing it because there was another one called exam <laughs> that was very <laughs> Yes, 50 strangers facing execution have to pick one person among them to live. Oh, yes. interesting. Actual description of that film, not mm -hmm. what I just told you. Um, yeah, that's uh that's interesting. I like that. Um, we also have, of course, Saw is yes. right up that perfect on both fronts. Uh it is Spawned a game a and franchise. Yep. Um also James Wan. James Wan did that, right? Same guy who did so. Malignant and uh Conjuring? Do you conjuring? Insidious? I don't know. Anyways, uh, we'll come back to that. <laughs> that, that we could just also just cut yes, that it out is entirely. Game one. Great. No, awesome. it's Sam one. It is. Uh, buried. This is Ryan Reynolds. Uh, yes. Buried in. Like, uh, buried alive. With buried alive. But and the whole film phone? takes. Yeah, the whole film yeah. takes place inside a coffin. Which I'm very I'm like, intrigued by this. Brilliant. Like, mm -hmm. how do you how do you tease that? Like, this is the the joy of bottle films is like how do you have in such limitation how do you have just one actor and he's like digging through his pockets trying to get mm -hmm. out the couple of classics on here hitchcock's uh rear window yeah uh there is kind of a there is a game to this movie somewhat like not quite literally a game but there is a game but against uh, the cat and mouse of like i see them seeing me seeing them yeah. murder yeah. somebody it's in the I cat can't and get mouse out realm, so yeah. now what but uh definitely bottle movie as well um and then we have Knife in the Water, which I don't know super well. I don't know this one very well at all. This is a, a, a Roman Polanski film. Um, essentially, similar vibes, from what I understand, to Funny Games. It's a like, couple on a boat picks up a handsome stranger. Yeah. Whose intentions may be not altogether pleasant, but they 
they all emerged knowing themselves in a very different way than when they started the film kind of yes. films. So let's go to our letterboxed. Uh, I'm going to not do all of these because we have a lot, but I, I'm going to focus on the ones that kind of that kind of stood out that's sort of interesting. Uh, Benjamin Barron throws out Rob Zombie's 31. It's like there's a sadistic game involved. Carnival Ooh, Don't sadistic. know enough about this okay. movie, but okay. intrigued. Um, so there is a an 80, 1986 movie called The Wind. Author goes to a Greek island to write, but runs into a resident who wants to play a deadly game. Ooh, that sounds I fun. like an unknown 80s movie. And then right. uh, Benjamin uh, brings up one of my favorite movies of all time, Dogtooth, which I think is going to be similar to Bo is Afraid in that it is on the periphery. Yorgos Lanthimos movies are all on the periphery of horror. Um, yeah. But Dogtooth is fantastic. The game is the games in it are mind games more than literal game games. Sure. Uh, Atomic Chaz, uh, I'm sorry. Atomic, Atomic Baz, Baz wants to know, does the purge count as deadly game? I think the first one does because it's pretty much a bottle movie. It all takes place in the house, right? Is that your next or is that the purge? No, the well, I mean, the your purge next is like is like Ethan Hawke thing. and you know, like if they're they're trying to keep their house sacred. Okay. That's the right. night of the you're purge. Right. You're right. Um, okay, so we also have uh, Peter Burt throws out The Collector, gruesome and thrilling, what happens when a burglar enters the wrong house. Ooh. Peter also throws out Your Next. Not yeah. exactly a game, but cat and mouse, right? Yeah. Uh, let's go with uh, Jack, uh, Jack Sky points out Devil, which is an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Yep. All takes place in an elevator, I believe. Yes. And I don't know what the they game know is here. That well, they know one of them is the devil. And yeah. the game is who's the liar. Oh, that's interesting. I love that. Uh, oh, uh, v uh, Verdetta brings up Climax, which yeah. this is I, this is definitely a bottle movie. The games are it's less of a game as it is just like a bunch of a dance troupe. Um, yes, They're all playing troupe. Zip Zap Zop. They're all playing Zip Zap Zop and, a, and essentially a psycho killer doses them all with like some narcotic that brings out all of their inner rage and they essentially attack each other both okay. physically and mentally and emotionally. So I guess that's the game. Like, can you destroy your friends? Yeah. Oh, that's a fun game. That's one of my favorites. That, <laughs> that and Trivial Pursuit. Josh yeah. Ludd throws out Would You Rather from 2012. Surprisingly oh good God, morality tale with yeah. high stakes game playing at the worst dinner party ever. And oh, who knew no. that Jeffrey Combs and Sasha Gray were in a movie together? Um, a really gross bug throws out fall the 2022 film about the women who climb that tower and the ladder falls away and it's a it's an acrophobia sort of movie oh, dear. it looks horrifying i don't know that that's a game so much as just yeah. they're just climbing but it is a bottle movie oh uh strong gash gerald's game literally has game of the title of course and it's strong definitely a bottle movie i didn't think about this one good one good one on you strong gash um yeah strong ash i love that i love that a lot um uh, he, uh strong ash also brings up circle that you mentioned earlier gerald's game is a great one um just read that book recently it is it oh, is yeah? yeah i think i'm more curious of seeing the movie than i was in reading the book but uh mm -hmm. you know you know you know you know how stephen king can be right oh, cecil sure. you yeah, know yeah, yeah. um yeah. We also have ATM from Strong Ash 2. Three colleagues head to an ATM late at night and spot a hooded figure lurking outside. When he attempts to kill them in cold blood, they are forced to fight for their lives. Uh, it's sort of interesting. Uh, um, so Sav, Sav also brought up Braid. I don't know mm. this one. Two drug dealers on the lam uh, hide in a friend's house, but they have to participate in her twisted games in order to stay. Interesting. So many games. This a is... lot of really, really good uh really really good suggestions here uh circle has me kind of interested gerald's game has me super interested uh i don't know that i'm dying to watch climax but you know whatever that's a big one that, yeah that, you it, know, we could get sometimes to. the metaphor is a little too strong in yeah. these where you're just like oh jesus um oh there's one more that um oh, please that I, just something that i've not heard of that sounds really interesting brave crab uh brought up the belco experiment uh, oh, an ordinary right. day at the office becomes a horrific quest for survival when 80 employees at the Belco Corp um, in Bogota, Colombia, learn that they are pawns in a deadly game. And so it's sort oh. of corporate, corporate mentality as game. And it's got a pretty phenomenal cast as well. That does but again, really interesting. So many. Okay, but here's the thing. Okay, let's, Jeffrey, what, what of these many, many movies 
uh, are exciting you the most? Like okay. Top three. All right. Uh, Belko Experiment might have just moved into my top three. That sounds really cool. It's a movie that's come up a lot. Uh, I, you know, I do want to, uh, I do want to get to this at some point in time. I will also say as a film that is an hour and 25 minutes long, that sounds really great. Uh, Hush sounds really good. Love Mike Flanagan. Your, your pitch that it is tightly written. It is just a in and out zip zap zop, right? It is everything is, is I, I love that. I love having a, a tight script after coming off of this. Uh, I think uh, I do not want to watch this movie at all, but I think it's important that we get to it eventually as funny games. Yeah. So those would probably be my top three. I have plenty of honorable mentions on this list too, but let's just for time's sake, those will be my three. Belko, Hush, yeah. Funny Games. I Honestly, the same. I think, the, I think those are my three as well. Okay. Yeah, like there's a lot of other really good stuff, but I think those hit the spirit of Deadly Games and the spirit of Bottle Movie the most. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, I think uh I think I like that. Shall we whittle it down from these three whereas in funny games and Belko but are very much games. Yes. Hush is cat and mouse so more metaphorical yeah, games. Yeah, that's true. That is true. So we could coin flip between funny games and that or we could say with these three roll a die even numbers even or um, odds. 1 and 2 hush, 3 4 funny games, 5 6 is Belko. Okay. We could do that okay. way too. Yeah, what do you do think that. of that? Do you yeah, want me to roll? You we... want to roll? Uh, I'll roll. That's a four. Funny games, motherfucker. Here we go. Damn it! I should have rolled. Now, um, which no, one it's... do we watch? Do we watch oh, the Swedish or or the or the original or the, the German, the, the English remake? Um, both are good. They're kind of the same. <laughs> I think he did do the exact same movie, right? He made um, a shot for like almost shot for shot. And listen, I love Naomi Watts, and I love um. Like it's great, but I am also I kind I saw the original first, and so mm-hmm. it's sort of imprinted on my brain as the original. My gut is always if you have the choice to go to the original first. Yeah, yeah, and it's available to stream uh, on HBO uh, Criterion, so you got it there. Let's do it. Fuck, let's finally watch this movie. God, let's damn play some you. funny games. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Cecil, for talking with me. And if you have thoughts on Bo is Afraid, which you will, or ideas for other movies that would have been good, what did we roll here? Deadly Games meets Bottle Film. Let us know on Twitter at Random Horror 9 or over at Instagram, too. And watch the original Funny Games from 1997, Michael Haneke, with us this week. And come on back next Tuesday for a new episode. Have a restful night with no brown recluse loose in your apartment or nothing. Boo! Boo!